Welcome to this April edition of Doug and Friends. It is a, uh, this is Doug. Hi. And we're the friends. Um, this is a special edition of Doug and Friends because we have a new friend. This is Sean DeMars from the Room for Nuance podcast. Also has another, defend and confirm. You do, yeah, that's you right. do a couple of podcasts, yeah, that's right? right. Okay, so one is for conservatives, the other one's for liberals. Okay, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> You're just hitting everybody. Right, that's the truly third way. Um, and uh, Sean actually is going to be here to uh, to ask the questions. So yeah. you, this is your rodeo, man. So you're yeah. gonna you're gonna light it up here. Man, this thank is you. Both both programs. It's a mosh pit it's, of talk shows. It's a yes. Yeah, we're the, we're the all Moscow <laughs> mosh pit. Yeah, that's right. Look at that. That's right. Uh, so on the Room for Nuance, first of all, thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on the Room for Nuance podcast, we like to be a little pharisaical. We, no. okay. we like to start off with prayer, if that's okay. Just ask yeah. for the Lord's help yeah. for a productive conversation. Brother, would you pray yeah. for us? Thank Happy you. to do it. Father, we're grateful for your kindness and faithfulness to us. Uh, we want this conversation to be edifying and fruitful, so grant us grace to have uh, sharp minds and um, go where you would want us to. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Which is not pharisaical because it wasn't a lengthy prayer. <laughs> that's, that's right. right. It was very yeah, brief. Right. I did not pile up any words. Yeah, God is in heaven, you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. That's right. There you yeah. go. <laughs> um, let's start off with the most important question. Which race is your least favorite? <laughs> okay. Which, which what? Which race? race? Which race? race? Oh, mine. <laughs> <laughs> mine is a 5K. Okay. That's, oh, that was what well played. You, what were you guys well, thinking? <laughs> well played. All right. Everybody all loose? Yeah, we're all good. right. Here that's we go. Good. Uh, just start off with some scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. You guys know it well. But, but do we know it? Right? Do we really know this? Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, and with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Uh, I wanted to start here because I think that uh, apart from the Moscow mood question, which we're going to get to in a minute, yeah. I do think you brothers have an eagerness to maintain unity. Some people may disagree with the strategy that you have chosen in order to accomplish that, right. but I see a desire for Catholicity in you brothers, like true Catholicity, mm -hmm. uh, that I admire. And evidence of that is that we're having this conversation now. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so let's start off with some encouragement, then let's go to some points of agreement, and then we'll get all wrapped around the axle on some of the more contentious stuff. Okay, so an encouragement. Joe, this is going to be heavily aimed at Doug. Do it. So, uh, but I'm so thankful I'm just that a you're problem. here. Uh, brother, I just wanted to just highlight different ways that the Lord has used you in your ministry to strengthen my faith. So I just want to go all the way back with the collision debates. Okay. I mean, seeing you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Christopher Hitchens at the time when new, the new atheism was on the rise, and to, in many ways... To, to my view, get the best of him because you were standing on the word of God. Mm -hmm. It was just so formative for me as a young Christian. I was coming out of the prosperity gospel. I was becoming reformed. Right. I was wrestling with all kinds of questions. And here's this small town pastor from Idaho who's like crushing this intellectually elite guy. And it was just really useful. Uh, yeah. Easy chairs, hard words. Yeah. I still give that book away. I just think it's one of the best books that I can give to someone in the pew to help them understand and, and believe the doctrines of grace. We're going to come back to that book here in a little, a okay. little bit. I've benefited greatly from not only your writing ministry, but the writing ministry of your children. You know, Indy mm -hmm. Wilson, my daughter, found out that we were going to be here. And she was like, are you going to get to meet the guy who wrote the cupboards <laughs> books and all of that stuff? And then your willingness to apply all of Christ to all of life, you know, Christian education, well, th though I may not agree with your political prescriptions uh, across the board, you're just your desire to see the gospel applied to all of life, brother. So thankful mm -hmm. for it. Well, thank you. Thank the Lord. Yeah. 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 And Joe, uh, nice hair. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I worked hard at it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I just wanted to highlight some points of agreement because we're going to talk about some disagreements. But the, the most important thing about us uh, is what we have in common as first order issues, and I think we have a lot in common. So I wanted to just start with the five solas, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because I think within the five solas, you have reformed soteriology, the trustworthiness and sufficient nature of scripture, the uniqueness of Christ and salvation. If it was faith, grace, and all that stuff without the alone, I don't know if that would be true, but it's grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, the authority of scripture alone, the glory right. of God alone. So you brothers heartily affirm all of the five solas. Amen to all of that. That's right. Now, when we get to talking about federal vision stuff here in a minute, which we don't have to hang out on for too long, 
uh, I think this will come back up again. Yeah. Then just some other points of compliment uh, of agreement. So complementarianism and not uh, squishy complementarianism. Right. I mean, I think complementarianism doesn't really matter unless it's thick, you right. know, unless you can build a house on it, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, pro-life. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we'd agree on like the abolitionism versus um, incrementalism question. Maybe we can talk about that. Opposition to all manifestations of LGBTQ stuff while trying to love them in that sin and confusion. I think you brothers would agree with me that wokeness is wicked. Yeah. Shouldn't have any place in the church. Right. Okay. And so on and so forth. Okay. So there we go. Now, uh, to getting to some of the disagreements, I feel like I'm just talking a lot. <laughs> is there anything you no, you're guys setting want to it up. Say? You're setting it up very nice. I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying, man. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of my perspective on how I have sort of shifted away from Moscow over the years. 10, 12, yeah, 10, 10 or 12 years ago, people have been disagreeing with you guys forever. But I always found myself being like the Doug Wilson or the Moscow or the Can Impress apologist. You know, mm -hmm. like, man, they're so bold, they're so brave, they're so wise, they're so careful. They're writing about things and, and tackling things that other people aren't or won't or whatever. Uh, don't be in an echo chamber, all, all of that stuff. But it, what, it felt like, what, what, it, what it felt like happened to me, especially over the last seven years of me being a pastor, is it felt like death by a thousand cuts. It, it, it felt like, okay, well, I don't agree with what he said about certain aspects of chattel slavery in the United States, but he says all this other good stuff. And then it was... Well, yeah, I don't agree with theonomy, you know, but there's all this other good stuff. And no, Federal Vision, you know, I'm not even sure I really understand it. From, but from what I do understand of it, uh, I, I, I don't really know. Right. And yeah, I did see that article where he used the C word, you know. So it just it, it felt like after a while, I just could no longer have the same kind of enthusiasm and vigor in defending, promoting, giving away resources from you guys. Not that you need me to do that. But I'm just trying to share my perspective with you on, on kind of how I got to where I've gotten in my relationship with Moscow. So, here, so here's a, an additional factor. Okay. <clears throat> and that is, you mentioned before you were a pastor, you're just one of the guys talking to people about things you find helpful. Yeah. And if you're one of the guys, people sort and share things out. If you talk, if you talk that way to a parishioner yeah. and they, they agree with you, in disagreeing with something I said or did, yeah, and you say, yeah, but they do a lot of good stuff, they're going to hold you personally responsible as their pastor yeah, for that. That's right. right. In, instead of being <laughs> up and down the pew, they're going to say, oh, is he secretly, he said he disagrees with that, mm -hmm. but does that's, he really? Yeah, that's but right. does he really? Yeah. So basically you've got additional responsibilities as a pastor yeah. to shepherd these people. Yeah. I had the same challenge back in the day with the Reconstructionists, mm -hmm. because during the 80s, I was um, vacu vacuuming up what they were teaching because, you know, although I differed with a number of things that they said, yeah. they were the only ones who were trying to apply the Bible to everything. Mm -hmm. and, and I was hungry for that. <coughs> but I couldn't, as a pastor, I couldn't just distribute their books <laughs> freely. Oh, really? So um, you weren't giving out Gary North? and I was not. Okay. I, I was um, taking Hilter. a lot of Gary North in. Yeah. I was leading, reading a lot of Rush Dooney, yeah. but I wasn't in a position to say, here, let's cover the book table with these guys yeah. because I didn't have a big enough pastoral filter to go around and catch all the things right. that would, people would be picking up. Either people who thought that I agreed with that particular thing and went along with it and I was going, ah, or uh, they disagreed with it strongly and yeah. assumed that I must agree with it or must have a secret affinity. Uh, so I I feel your pain. Thanks, man. <laughs> man, that was some empathy right there, guys. Yeah. I just feel <laughs> like <laughs> true so we did it. Tell him how he's in sin. Tell him right. how he's in sin. Uh, I also say, though, you should just know what you articulated there in terms of the death by a thousand cuts. Um, you're not the only one. That's a. I, I'd say there's a there's a good number of people who are probably in that same boat. So well, how should... do you respond to someone who's, who says that to you? Love you guys, but like it's just too much. So um, I would say... Dial back the dose. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this, the, you know, this, this um, I find this helpful, uh, but I didn't find that helpful. Well, read the helpful stuff. Okay. You, basically, um, 
if if you um, we we appreciate it when someone out there understands all of our jokes and understands all of the things we say yeah. and is prepared to go to the wall. No, they're great. They're great. And I'll defend everything. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I appreciate that. But I also am not delusional and I don't see why on earth someone on, across the country who hasn't talked to me about a bunch of these things would yeah. automatically sign off on my thinking when they haven't heard it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, I know that there are people out there. I know there are good pastors out there who hate the sound of Doug Wilson's name mm. um, because there's a fanboy of mine in the congregation <sighs> Brother, that, listen. that comes <laughs> up and says, what you said in the sermon, that third point, that's not what Doug Wilson says. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, basically, that's not yeah. helpful. Yeah. And I get it. So the, one, this is probably going to come up later. But what we're talking about is a problem that is created by mass communication. Okay. Okay. If we're having a conversation like this, Paul says to the Galatians, I wish I could be there in person so I could change my tone. Yeah, that's right. I can, I can read your reactions. I can adjust what I'm saying, and we can really get somewhere. Personal conversations accomplish a lot, right? But in mass communication, when you're writing for tens of thousands of people, it's a, it's a statistics game, right? It's, you, you can't adjust um, for this, let's say 15% aren't going to get the joke or they're going to be offended by something. And I can, okay, I can adjust for them, but yeah. now I'm turning off right. 65% who say, what, what, did somebody get dug onto his meds? Or what, what happened? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so you have, to, you have to look at the population you're aiming at. What is the target audience? Who are you writing for? Okay. okay. And, and back in the late 80s, and I've not changed since that time, back in the late 80s, I decided that my target audience, when I'm writing, I'm writing for an evangelical who is distressed at everything he sees falling apart all around him, is worried that it's him. <laughs> Am I going crazy? <clears throat> Am I going yeah, crazy? Right. Uh, I don't like this at all. And then he gets something I, I wrote, and he says, it's not me. That's, I, I couldn't put my finger on it, but that's, that's what I've been worried about. So that's the person that I care the most about reaching. Okay. The, the person who's beleaguered, outnumbered, uh, his session, his writing his case over different things. He wishes that they didn't have women doing the scripture reading, <laughs> you know, whatever the thing yeah. is in their yeah, church. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm writing, I'm, I write to be a lifeline to that guy. Okay. And, uh, and if I'm reaching that guy, mission accomplished, if I'm turning off somebody who's hostile from the get-go, I don't worry about it. If I lose somebody who could have been persuaded if I was their next-door neighbor and they knew me personally, I'm, I'm sad about that. Sorry about that. Sure. But I'm not going to abandon the, the cohort that I'm writing for. Okay. Uh, because I decided a long time ago that cohort is huge. That, that, co that cohort that I write for has been utterly abandoned by the evangelical leadership and there's no one to speak for him. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about one of the bigger cuts of the, mm -hmm. of the thousand cuts. And there's not quite a thousand, obviously, but uh, I, I get this one a lot from Presbyterians. Okay. They're pretty adamant here about the federal vision stuff. Uh, Monergism.com back when it was hard to find good reform books and that was one of the few places you could do it. They used to have like a warning next to the Easy Chair's Hard Words right. book that said, we love Douglas Wilson's book here. It's so helpful, despite his heresy. Right. And they don't, I mean, they're not, yeah. not heterodoxy, you know, right. heresy. heresy. Yeah. Right. Um, so. <laughs> Which is a weird I, thing to do, by the way. <laughs> How come? <laughs> Oh, why, sell the book anyway. Well, yeah, why would you sell the book anyway? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because I, that, that doesn't sound like someone who really believes it. Yeah. They, they need to put some distance or daylight yeah. Yeah. so that people will lay off. Yeah. They right. have to call it a harsh name. Interesting. But you're still selling the book? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a John Piper clip from many moons ago uh, with him and I think M Matt Chandler and Mark Driscoll where your name comes up and the Federal Vision stuff comes up. And he says he listened, he listened to all of the, the recordings of a trial or whatever mm -hmm. you went through about that. 
And he said, you know, I listened very carefully, and to me it sounds exactly like the kind of error I would expect a Presbyterian to make, mm -hmm. but it does not sound heretical. Right. For someone who's not still quite sure that I understand federal vision, could you help me understand what John Piper means by that? Yeah, I, you might be able to help more yeah, yeah. on, on yeah. that. Yeah, so I, I think, so John is assiduous in his attentiveness. That's the language he would use. Mm. He pays very careful attention and tries to understand people on their own terms and to, to read charitably and for understanding and clarity. And so what he means is, as a Baptist, he recognizes that, that Doug's going to say things like, um, there are Christians and there are Christians. Mm -hmm. meaning there are external Christians mm -hmm. and there are internal Christians. There's a visible church and there's an invisible church. And this is a classic Presbyterian Reformed distinction, right? And so a lot of the stuff that's working out of the, the federal vision is working out sort of the meaning of what does it mean to have inside Christians and outside Christians, to have a visible church and an invisible church, and for the visible church to be an objective reality that God recognizes and that matters, Okay, and so as a Baptist, he goes, I, he doesn't want to have it work quite that way because he doesn't have infant baptism. He's not going to emphasize the objectivity of that covenant in the same way or the continuity between the old and the new in the same way. So he's saying, I've got all kinds of Baptist reasons why I would disagree with Doug, but I, I think I'm just disagreeing with a Presbyterian who means it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's as to be expected. Um, and, and many pr Baptists, and I did when I was a Baptist, thought that paedo communion, the thing that really sticks in many Presbyterians' oh, craw, right. Baptists think paedo communion yeah. is consistent. Oh, it just, absolutely. It just makes right. sense. It's right. like, it absolutely. makes good sense. Yeah. So uh, John Piper is not going to be freaked out by paedo communion. Mm -hmm. He's going to wonder why all, all the rest of you guys aren't doing that. Yeah. Aren't, aren't doing that. Okay. So the, if, I, if I were to put my finger on the, the sore spot, uh, Joe just touched on it, the sore spot in uh, the whole federal vision thing would be the objectivity of the covenant. Mm -hmm. So it's not just internal Christian, the kind of Christian who goes to heaven when he dies. Uh, a true Jew is not one who is one outwardly, but mm -hmm. one inwardly circumcised in the heart by the Spirit. Someone baptized uh, by the Spirit is uh, elect, regenerate, going to heaven when they die, okay? And everybody has a category for visible church, mm -hmm. right? So you've got the roster of the elect, the decretally elect, known to God, and then you have the some the library of all the church directories, mm -hmm. yeah. all the names and phone numbers of all the mm -hmm. visible church members. As a Baptist, I'm tracking. <clears throat> okay. Yep. okay, so that that's visible, invisible. The thing that gets me in trouble is that I believe that I believe in that distinction of visible and invisible, mm -hmm. but I believe that the visible church really does have an objective connection to Christ in some sense. But not in a salvific sense? Not, not in a salvific sense, okay. but an objective connection to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, through the and, ordinances. Uh, yeah, and just for the, the, the visible church is the church of Christ. It's the body of Christ. Well, yeah, when they gather, his presence <clears throat> is there with them. Right. Now, the church is going to be without spot or wrinkle at the end of history or any such blemish. But it's got spots and wrinkles and blemishes now. Mm -hmm. There are dead branches in the vine John 15, that get cut out. There are non-fruit-bearing branches in the olive tree, Romans 11, that get cut out. So I believe that that, obviously, if a branch is cut out of the olive tree, it's, that's not one of the decretally elect. But it was in the olive tree. That, and the fact that I say there's a connection to Christ that's not salvific, but this person is in some sense... Mm -hmm attached to the body of Christ in a way that God recognizes is the sore spot. That's the thing that makes people mm -hmm. uh, kick. So if, if I said, well, the non-elect church member is a bit of tumbleweed that got caught in the branches of the olive tree, then we say, ah, very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's tumbleweed or the next door neighbor's frisbee kid, the next door neighbor's kid got his frisbee caught in the branches. Well, it's in the tree, but it's not of the tree. That's easy for us to process. But the illustrations of Scripture have a more organic connection. Uh, Caiaphas grew on the olive tree. Judas grew on the olive tree. And the many professing Christians um, who, are, who apostatize or who die and go to hell, 
they're Christians in the sense that they're not Buddhists. You know, they're Christians in the sense that they're members of the visible church. But they're, but they're not elect. Okay. So, uh, so I hold, I'm a Westminsterian on my soteriology, um, the five solas. I'm just Westminster Confession uh, down the line. Mm -hmm. What the analogy, that, and I, when I was a Baptist, all of that made sense to me. You're, not, you're no longer a Baptist. No, no, okay. I'm made a Baptist. Um, but when I was a Baptist years ago, that made sense to me, even as a Baptist. Yeah. And part of one of the things that helped um, the analogy that he used in one of the books was like a, the wedding ring. So yeah. the sacraments are like a wedding ring. Um, and so there's an objective sense in which that person, those people are married. The question is whether he's a faithful husband or an unfaithful husband. So he's a real husband, okay? And God recognizes this person mm -hmm. is covenantally obligated to fulfill his duties as a husband. So he's, he's covenantally obligated to do so. But if he commits adultery, if he cheats, he's now an unfaithful husband, but, he, but, but you wouldn't say about him, well, he was never a real husband in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right, he was like, no, that's why it's wor that's why it's really bad is because he was a, a real husband. He mm -hmm. was covenantally bound, mm -hmm. and now he's being unfaithful to the terms of the of the covenant that he was in, and therefore he should he has a, a stricter punishment. In that sense, baptism and participation in the Lord's Supper is like is, is like the wedding ring, and so you say that person's really covenanted with Christ. There's obligations that that person has by virtue of their baptism. Um, and, that, and, I, and I could have said that as a Baptist. Yeah, they've taken, they, in, in that sense, as a Baptist, a Baptist could say, yeah, they've taken upon themselves the obligations of a Christian, right, to be faithful to Christ. And now they've fallen away and they've rejected him. It's worse for them because they were a real, they were really covenantally mm -hmm. bound. Um, and you don't, you don't sort of allow their apostasy to overturn everything that came before it. Right. Yeah. And if, if there's, not to complicate this, but I think this extra complication shows how in illustrations like marriage, we understand the distinction that I'm trying to make with regard to the church. We understand it perfectly. So let's say this cheating husband come, comes back to his wife. He gets radically saved. He repents of his adultery. He comes back to his wife, confesses everything to her, and she receives him and then says in her joy, finally tonight I have a husband. Well, the reason, and if he were to say, Really? I wasn't your husband before? Well, that would mean that I wasn't cheating. <laughs> no, you were right. really cheating because you were a husband in sense A. But now that you've repented and our, our union is what it ought to be, he's also now a husband in sense B. Okay. So, uh, thought experiment, or maybe not much of a thought experiment. A baby is baptized with air quotes. Am I right? Um, a baby. No, with, no, no. with water. <laughs> no. We, yeah, we, we don't baptize no one. No one. Uh, no one gets uh, baptized with air quotes. Uh, a, ba a baby gets baptized in your church, and you call him a Christian. Yeah. Right. You don't mean when you call him a Christian that he's saved. Yeah. We we are we are making no claim about right. the regenerate yeah. status of the child at that moment. Yeah. And that would be probably the biggest issue with most of, of the critics is that you, uh, and I guess I say most of the critics, you've interacted with far more of them than I have. But from those that I have talked to, the, the conflation of being a Christian without being regenerate, that's what that's, it kind of that's, comes back to. That would be a difference with the Reformed Baptists. Right, yeah. That's okay. Right. Um, but with Presbyterians. Yeah, tell me why they're so mad at you. Uh, I have and, they, no, and you say on, that you're historic... Westminster, and they say, not, no, you're not. On, on this point, I honestly don't know. Okay. Because if I, were li if I were to listen to one of them talk about uh, what we're claiming when we baptize a, uh, an infant, I'd say, yeah, I agree with that. that yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, yeah, he might be converted 10 years later. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, the, the sign is not so annexed um, to the moment of administration that you have to claim regenerate status at that moment or ever, right? So there is no daylight at all between my position and the Westminsterian position on what happens when you baptize an infant. That infant might be regenerate before, might be regenerated at that, at that moment, might be regenerated years later, might never be regenerated. Yeah. Uh, that sounds more reasonable than some of the stuff Martin Luther had to say about infants and, <laughs> yes, and baptism we, and regeneration. We make allowances for Lutherans. We've got to make allowances for <laughs> we Luther. Always, yeah. We love them. <laughs> I mean, he grew up in the seedbed of Roman Catholicism. <laughs> Give him a pass, you know. Yeah. 
Were you going to say something else, brother? Uh, I was going to say that there also is an element in which, you know, I, like when I listened to your interview with Ligon Duncan, the way that he talked, and he, you know, I guess he was the, he was raised in a house where his dad was a Presbyterian and his mom was a Baptist. Uh -huh. So they had kind of a, um, the way that he talked about his upbringing sounded to me much more like the way Baptists talk about being raised. He, he talked more in terms of um, a conversion experience and, and so forth like that. And it sounded to me a little more Baptist okay. than, um, than Westminster does, which I, which I know is odd, but it's like, to my ears, um, I know that he was baptized as an infant, I, I, you know, in the Presbyterian church, but it didn't seem to have the, he would, I don't think he would talk in terms of, and that child was therefore covenantally bound, um, married to Christ, objectively speaking, recognized by God, and therefore obligated to grow up to trust Christ. Yeah. Um, I don't know that he would use the strong language because he was operating more in what I would call a Baptist frame. Gotcha. Um, and some of what I think was going on in the federal vision, and I think so the guys that I've talked to who were there, that aren't here, but were a part of that whole thing, there was a number of things animating the federal vision that don't get sort of the same um, play nowadays because it all becomes about this sort of thing. But some of it was, um, we want a higher liturgy, we want weekly communion, which wasn't common in the PCA mm -hmm. back then. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted more formal psalm singing and um, sort of reformation of worship, um, which on those grounds, I talked to some guys the other day who said, on those grounds, we won because there's a lot more PCA churches that practice weekly communion mm -hmm. now. A lot of young guys that are sort of absorbing what the federal vision was pushing for um, first. Um, but the linchpin was this pedo communion thing, because mm -hmm. by admitting a child to the table, as soon as they're able to, you know, ingest bread and, and drink, yeah. um, you are saying something about, hey, we're regarding them as full insiders. Yeah. We're not sort of doing a, they're in, but they're not, they're in, but they're not. Yeah. Um, you know, where we're going to wait till they make a public profession of faith, can articulate the gospel, and do the whole nine yards, which again sounds like what Baptists do before baptism. Yeah. Um, and so it was that, so the Pato communion thing really did become a rub yeah. because it was, if we really believe that baptism unites one to Christ covenantally, not necessarily spiritually, savingly, it'll be in heaven, but covenantally they're bound to Christ, then we should treat them that way. Yeah. And so that's what the Pato communion Yep. practice does. And that was a big, that, that, like, that was the most visible thing that blows yeah. up over it. So. Well, if you're a Presbyterian and you're watching or listening to this and you wish I would have pressed Doug and <laughs> Joe harder on this, I can't because I can only argue like a Baptist and I didn't agree with them when I got here. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about theological triage. Okay. Um, let's start with this question. Joe, give you a chance to be the provocateur you are so naturally. Yeah. In one of the emails that you and I exchanged, I said, at some point, I would love to talk with you about uh, empathy and sure. whether or not it's a sin. And you wrote back and said, I would like to talk to you about nuance and whether or not it's a sin. <laughs> Rosaria Butterfield told me in my interview that, in my interview with her, that nuance is a postmodern neologism and we shouldn't use it. Uh, her recommendation for a replacement for that word in our podcast was room for teleology. Anyways, uh, so <laughs> yeah. what say you, Joe yeah. Rigney? Is is nuance a, a bad word? Should we not use it? Um, I think I think I would put nuance in the same bucket. I'm putting empathy. So I've got a category for the good kind of empathy. I know it. I know when people are using it in just a normal. Um, you mean untethered empathy? Yeah. So untethered empathy is the bad it's thing. Sinful, untethered right. nuance. Also. Untethered nu nuance. <laughs> untethered be, most any good. Right. Thing yeah. All the good things bad. untethered. Yeah. They should all be tethered to Jesus. Um, but nuance suffers from some of the same defects I think that empathy does. It goes wrong in the same ways, and it's going wrong in those ways like right now a lot. So um, the, first, the first one would be selectivity. So oftentimes the people who advocate most forcefully for nuance, we need to be nuanced, are selectively nuanced. It means that certain people are going to get all kinds of charity and mm -hmm. grace, and we're going to make allowances but it's going to be selectively applied. And there's another group of people who are going to get zero nuance whatsoever. They're just going to get hammers. They're going to get... BLM riots, J6 protesters. Right. Right. So nuance yes. with one, yeah. lock yeah. them up in the other. Yeah. That's, that, that's selective nuance. Right, yeah. exactly. The other thing is, I think um, my, my substitute for nuance, the thing that I'm always after is clarity, which I think gets you everything that... So like the way that I think compassion... Biblical compassion gets you everything that empathy, the good stuff that's in empathy, but then more. I think clarity gets you everything good that's in nuance and more. So the difference is this. Nuance is often, um, hey, we want to, sh like, um, 
we, we need to show that this thing um, is as complex as it is. So um, it's complex and I need to show its complexity. That's the good kind of nuance. And I wanna say, amen, if it's complex, we should make sure we're nuancing and showing that complexity. Clarity gets you that, but clarity also says, and if it's simple, we better show that it's simple. Okay, and you get both. Whereas nuance sometimes will bleed in and say, we're gonna try to, here's something that's really simple and we're gonna complexify it because of nuance. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, things that ought to be just straight down the middle, clear, clear, are muddied by those who are advocating for nuance. And then on top of that, nuance, when they face a truly complex problem, they assume complex problems cannot be solved, right? So the yeah, only problems right. that can be solved are the simple ones, yep. and they complexify everything, uh, complicate everything. And then once you have your complex problem, you don't ever have to get to an answer, which right. is the which is the off ramp to relativism. Right. So uh, why can't a, uh, I can always tell uh, a liberal or a budding liberal if they start to wrestle with the contours of something, right? <laughs> right? right. That they wrestle with problems. Well, why can't we beat them up? Mm. <laughs> yeah, right. Why do we always have to wrestle? Mm. We, and and it's, it's like Jacob and the angel wrestling to a stalemate. Um, and then no resolution. No resolution. And, and, we, and so after all the nuance, smoke is cleared. We still don't know what we're supposed to do. So I would, so I would, that, that's why I'm always aiming for clarity. I want to show clear things, simple things to be as straightforward as they are. If something is complicated, I want to show that complexity. And I think clarity gets both, whereas nuance can get one of them, but often uh, complicates straightforward things. I think I understand what you're saying conceptually. I just don't know in, in, in the way that people speak if that if that holds up. I mean, certainly if you train the people around you to talk like that and think like that, maybe it can bleed out from there in a good way, praise God. But nuance, talking about shades of meaning, it feels like as soon as you use the word clarity, at some point you're going to have to explain that you're using the word clarity because this is a complicated subject that requires a nuanced discussion. Well, it would be like even with the federal vision thing. That's what um, I was, yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, so, of, yeah. so there's, there's a good example of there's a layers of issues involved here from your practices to what you think the practices mean to this theology that undergirds them. There's lots of layers involved there. So you would say, hey, I want to, let's be nuanced about this. I'd say, just as simply, let's be clear about it. Let's clarify what the nub of the mm -hmm. issue is at each place but the goal of clarity is to then bring resolution. Now we got to choose, is it this or is it that? It's going to push yeah. us towards action, whereas nuance allows us to kind of sit in the fog. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's at least the danger of it. Yeah. But, I, but if someone, so I know that when you're doing it, you're, you got a podcast named Room for Nuance, and having listened to it, I think you do a great job of trying to, trying to bring the clarity. I think, I think you're yeah. trying to bring clarity and using it for nuance. And just like normal people who use the word empathy to mean sympathy or compassion, yeah. I'm not going around correcting everybody. Sure, sure. But I'm still going to wave the banner and say, um, it's a good Be bet. careful. It's a good bet that in a theological conversation about, say, sexuality, yeah. first person to name nuance is probably uh -huh. going liberal. Sure, sure. And there's going to be no nuance for a racist. There's going to be no nuance for mm -hmm. J6. Uh, even the interview you did with Ligon, I think, demonstrated this yeah. precisely because it was new, there was nuance in all sorts of places except a few. And then all of a sudden, the yeah. nuance went out the window. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's not, there, there was no nuance about Moscow mood, yeah. but there was nuance about a whole host of other things. We can talk about that. We anticipated uh, people being squeamish about the word nuance. We put out a video before the podcast even launched, basically saying like, people are trying to have difficult conversations on a, on a time crunch. Like somebody writes a book about racial reconciliation in the church and they're like, all right, come on our show. You have 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Right. Like race in the church you think we're gonna yeah so uh, let's 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 have a long conversation about a complex issue right uh and and ex i think what you said is exactly right brother we want room for nuance precisely so that we can get to the truth not so we can obfuscate right. the truth right uh Amen. but I, what you said is noted and i will try to be as wise <laughs> and discerning as i can in the use of that word uh let's let's talk a little bit about evangelical discourse at at, at large right now uh, Doug, I remember, uh, I remember, I don't know how long ago it was, but you had a pretty long back and forth with Tabidi Onyebwile. I did. About yeah. your views on uh, racism and slavery and the history of that in our country. Right. And I remember reading those at the time, 
blown away by the charity, the grace, the love, the patience, the unity that was on display. Mm -hmm. That couldn't happen today. No. Well, and, it, and it came to sort of a crashing halt after because Tabidi got the treatment. Well, the nuanced treatment. <laughs> he got, he, Tabidi got worked over. What, what do you mean? He got oh, worked by his people, by for, his constituency? For being willing to talk with me. Yeah. He, um, in today's discourse, he platformed me. He treated me with respect. I treated him with respect. It, I thought it was a stellar. Oh. Uh, I was just very gratified by that exchange. Yeah. And I would have wanted to publish it in a book. Oh, absolutely. Uh, um, but uh, Tabidi didn't agree, and it was because he people yeah. he, he was at the bottom of a dog pot. Yeah. Um, because he, you know, how dare he uh, yeah. do what he did? Do you remember what year that was or roundabout? 2013. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, I didn't. He did. Was this guy I, autistic? I, well, you got a nerd I was in the middle over of, here. I was in okay. the middle of behind it. Like, a middle of, I was like all of that sort of stuff. Um, Doug came out to Minneapolis and his presence was a problem yeah. um, because it was, uh, you know, going to um, ruffle feathers in oh. the African American community where um, our pastors had been trying to build bridges and, and yeah. people were reading internet articles. And so we organized uh, kind of a get together back at one of those, maybe been 2009 for that one, um, where there was kind of a back behind the scenes discussion. Um, and then, so, and and that at, at some point then eventually led to, I think the BD finally saying, hey, um, Doug's being mainstreamed enough. He's speaking at Desiring God conferences. He was writing articles for Desiring God and for TGC. I think, did you write for TGC ever? I think once. I think he wrote for it. So, so there was a season. Check to see if it's still yeah, there. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, I doubt it. But, Room uh, for nuance. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> and so there was a, hey, this is a big enough deal. And Thabiti thought, I need to address it head on. And he decided to do so as a Christian and a gentleman. Like yeah. he actually said, I'm going to try to, yeah. we, it, it, this is serious enough that we can't just, um, you know, carpet bomb it and yeah. make accusations yeah. and then you had this great thing but it but it was the pressures to not do that yeah. were hard and heavy i remember eric mason was supposed to come and speak at in moscow at one point mm -hmm. uh, did he back out for some yeah, of the reasons he canceled the, because the um, pressure was applied basically yeah so and sometimes that we we don't have a way of knowing uh how much pressure it took it might just be, hey, did you ever, did you know who these guys are? Yeah. Uh, and then he backs out, or it could be, I want to go. You really better not. I want to yeah. go. You yeah. really. Um, we've had yeah. we've had numerous cancellations. Uh, people, this is what we call the embargo. Okay. Um, and the embargo, ba basically, this uh, this touches on something Joe and I were talking about, is that when, uh, in your interview with Ligon Duncan. He's got a personal relationship with Keller. Mm -hmm. He knows him. Mm -hmm. And he can say, we differ on a bunch of stuff, but I'm, I know him, mm -hmm. right? And I can work with him. And the same thing with Frame. I know, I know him. I've got all kinds of differences with him, but I know him. Yeah. And there are people who cannot afford to be in a relationship with me because they'd get to know me and I'd get to know them. And all of a sudden they would be uh, sort of on the chopping block for, uh, because they would have to... If they had integrity, they couldn't pile on you. Yeah. They, right. they couldn't They'd pile have on. to defend you. And the one, it basically in the whole evangelical world, and I'll say this to my dying day, give him all kinds of credit, is John Piper. Yeah. Uh, John Piper was the only one in that whole constellation of first-tier conference speaker types mm -hmm. who uh, took the trouble to pursue clarity. Yeah. Right. And it's not like uh, it's not once, like he one, agreed. One, yeah. It's not <laughs> once he gets no. clarity, it's not like he won't tell yeah. you yeah. <laughs> that you man, you're all messed up on this. Yeah. Um, but John disagrees with you like a Christian scholar and a gentleman, mm -hmm. and he and he does it within the context of a personal relationship, mm -hmm. and that personal relationship uh, cannot be allowed to form in this. Uh, day and age, uh, because once it forms, there would be people who start saying, you know, they're not so bad. They're not orcs out in Moscow. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That, that was the most illuminating thing. Like your interview with Ligon for me was really illuminating because of that contrast between the way and, it, and, and that the, the thing that was in play was the face to face interaction. I, so it was partnering with Keller, teaching with Keller, 
that said, hey, this is a big issue we disagree on, women's ordination and deaconesses or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but we, I know him, and he's a Christian brother. The same thing showed up with the, in the second version with Frame and McLeod and um, Robert Raymond, who he had big disagreements on the doctrine of the Trinity, on you know, doctrine of God stuff, right? Yeah, that stuff, yeah. yeah. so he was like, I, that, I, I'm not with them. I'm with the confessions, not with them. But I have all the affection in the world for them. And so it was, like, so he, so it was clear he's capable of that. And for me, it helped to shed light on the embargo. It's why those guys won't accept the invitations to come out here, why when we're coming out there, those invitations aren't given. Um, but what's interesting in the present day, I mean, you're here, so there is an element of like, there's a next generation of guys who don't, who didn't um, carpet bomb. I, I think some of this does go back to federal vision stuff where because everybody was call, saying heresy, 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 at this point, it would if to personalize him or anybody that's associated with FV would require probably a walk back because mm -hmm. as you got in if you had the conversation if you had the debate and you real and and we keep amening stuff then it makes it really hard to go you guys are heretics it might be oh emphasis differences or you want to accent that or accent that and it would be clear that oh that we're actually christian brothers who can disagree charitably like lots of christians do everywhere else right but that that but the wall already went up, and so now efforts have to be made to make sure it does. But there's another generation coming up for, for whom that's not that history is not there. That big issue is not the same. They they actually are listening more carefully, they trying to understand. And they won't have to walk anything back. Right, and they, they just got here. They just got here, so they don't have to walk anything back. And so it's possible to actually come have the conversations in ways that it wouldn't be for that older generation. Mm. The other thing to add on, to tag onto this is really striking, uh, and I pointed this out in my review of Woke Church and, and uh, Liggs um, forward to Woke Church, is that all the things he's concerned about in the federal vision are a glaring grease fire in Eric Mason's book. The deke okay. worth, the, yeah. what justification means. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of like, okay, you can be as wobble, I'm on, on justification, forensic justification, punctiliar justification, I'm a Westminsterian. Right, right down the line. And Eric Mason's fooling around with it in all the ways that Federal Vision people were accused of fooling around with it. Eric Mason really does. Right. Just from a different angle? Well, it was, it was no. the justification is both uh, a status and an action. And righteousness is both intrinsic and extrinsic. Mm. And, there's, and, and there's confusions all built up in it. He's quoting um, Fleming Rutledge, so Ang Anglican priestess, and Ernest Kasemon, who's a you know new perspective or proto new perspective sort of guy. So all of that's in that book, which if it had been him, if I'd written that, would have gotten the treatment. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it got it got passed over, and it was nuanced, right? And and so and I think the same thing's true even of like someone like Piper, because Piper gets criticized roundly by certain <laughs> reform types for judge, his view of judgment according to works. Um, that there's a concern that he's going to compromise justification mm -hmm. by faith alone. And his definition of saving faith, because which has he, to include affections, which includes the affections, yeah. which there's a treasuring Christ, and it's pro professors at RTS, you know, so it's um, Fesco and Waters who have really we had a debate uh, at ETS two years ago that I moderated between John and those two guys on the saving faith book, and those guys were, I mean, they were they were cordial and they were um, gracious in the sense of they were treating John like a brother, but they were really at you know adamant this is a big deal you're smuggling love and you're smuggling things into the definition of faith. This is proto-Roman Catholic. Like they're, those are the kinds of criticism they're making. But Ligon has no problem associating with John, you know, mm -hmm. being friends with John. But it, it's a different sort of thing because the wall went up when it did, and now it has to be maintained. Hmm. Well, let's jump even more into the Ligon Duncan <laughs> interview. All right, let's do. Uh, I just want you brothers to know my aim in bringing up that question with Lig about the Moscow mood was not, I'm not a pot stirrer. Right. I don't think so. I mean, I guess the Lord will tell yeah. me on the last day if my heart was confused in any of that. But uh, There's nothing wrong with stirring it was a, pots. It was, a, it was a totally fair question. Fair oh, well, you should tell all the angry people that on the internet <laughs> that what I did was a totally they don't fair listen, question. They don't <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> they, <laughs> they react to me. but they, uh, <laughs> I think I'm... I'm, I'm how do I want to ask this question? Um, a lot of a lot of discernment bloggers and a lot of their friends and family, <laughs> coworkers and neighbors, 
after that interview, they've basically said that Lig Duncan is a coward. Uh, he's woke. He needs to resign in shame. Uh, do you agree with that? No. I, th I think he... I think he needs to correct some things. Sure. I, th I think he needs to fix some things. And the, the angry hostels who are after him. Like all 50,000 of them. Yeah. yeah. yeah the, um, are, are after him because I, th I thought it was a very poor performance and it was provocative. Okay. So um, I don't think Christians ought to be provoked. My dad taught me always act, never react. And people are reacting to Lig Duncan. But he did some things that were he he can't be surprised that he's in a duel because yeah. he slapped some people with the gloves, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it was things like um, uh, slander, and uh, slander has no pl place in a Christian's mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 armory or no yeah. no place yeah. in, in a Christian's tactics. I don't have any reason to believe these people are Christians. Right. Well, what mm -hmm. is that? And right. who was he talking? You were talking about us, right? So he's he's saying I don't have any reason to believe that they're even Christians, right? And uh, I disapprove of slander. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. right. And then when he, uh, I, I heard that he concluded everything. There, there's a lack of self awareness, and everybody was saying, "Don't you see what you're mm -hmm. right? Don't you see what you're doing?" Right. Uh, and then uh, when he said uh, things like. Um, uh, if you these guys talk real big online, uh, but if you get them into a room, they'd curl up into a fetal position mm -hmm. in three seconds. And so, I, in my blog response to this, I pointed back in the middle of the FV thing. I was traveling down south for other reasons, mm -hmm. and I was going through. I was in Jackson, and a friend of Liggs offered to set up a mm -hmm. meeting. Yeah. Which so we contacted just to no cameras, no mics, just to personal contact, and he didn't know. No, thank you. So we're we are the ones eager to meet, talk, yeah. work things through. Public, private, P public, private. Yeah. Um, microphones, cameras, no microphones, no cameras. We've offered to fly other places, mm -hmm. and the the embargo is pretty solid when it comes to this. And but then for someone who's sort of ensconced behind the embargo wall to say if you got these people alone. They would just wilt. Well, can I push back on that a little sure. bit? Sure. Yeah. Uh, after the the maelstrom that was the response to that interview, I went back and I watched that clip more than more than once to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding things. Uh, it appeared to me that the fetal position comment and what was the other one that you said? The slander. The, the slander thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it seemed like he was speaking more broadly. Now you might say, well, that includes us, but I, I'm sure you know the Moscow mood describes describes an event that is beyond what is happening right here in Moscow. Right. And I don't think you guys would disagree with me that there are a lot of people on the internet who have adopted the Moscow mood or whatever, Adopt, or some derivation adopted thereof. The, adopted the name. Yeah, or you Moscow could call mood. it a bastardization of the Moscow mood, right? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but who, who are big and tough on the internet, but if you got them in the same room, they would wilt. They would... And when I went back and I watched that, it didn't seem like Lig had Moscow proper in mind. And I'm not... Well, Lig's a grown man. He can defend himself. I'm yeah. not trying to defend him. But I'm just telling you, honestly, my impression was he was speaking about kind of troublemakers on the internet in general. I think, I mean... I, That's I, me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the thing was, your question was specifically, talk about the Moscow mood, and then he brought up Kevin's article, uh -huh. which wasn't about internet, you know, bro culture. It was targeted specifically at two videos and why yeah, Moscow's yeah. influence was bad. Yeah. The response from me and Jared and, and everybody else uh -huh was, you know, we're defending the Moscow mood. So the question's about Moscow mood, and then the answer has to do with, and then he, so he took it where he did. And it wasn't, I, I, I would want to give him the charity and say, because I've met, you know, we've, he and I've talked, like yeah, we've, yeah. you know, when I was at Bethlehem, he would come through. And um, I don't think if I said, like, were you questioning my salvation? I think he would say, absolutely not. Right. Okay, so I, I, I would give him that charity. But when, when he made the comment, some of these people aren't even saved. Yeah, or yeah. and or the other one was though when you asked some other question and he I think it was when the slander and mockery thing came up, and he his first thing was which brings us back to the Moscow mood. Uh -huh. So he he circled back. But see that shows me that when he was talking about that he wasn't really talking about 
you guys. I think he was talking about internet discourse I think you're with right. mockery I th and slander. I think you're right. He was starting there. But what it triggered in his head is uh -huh. that's Moscow mood. Yeah. That where's, where, where did they learn to do that? Sure. And they learned it from him. Right? Yeah. And th so here, if, if Lig were to contact me or if I were to talk to him and he were to say, oh, man, I, I wasn't talking about you at all, I'd accept that completely. Okay. But it sure looked like he was talking about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, Which, and so if, if what he said got the chimps jumping yeah. and, and yeah. there was this big reaction, I think that whatever things the, the people who are out of control need to correct with God and yeah. cool their jets and, yeah. and whatever they're doing, I think Lig needs to take responsibility for having been provocative in a way that it, it may not have been slander and mockery on his part of us particularly, but it sure looked that way. Okay. It, it, he, just, and, he should have been more careful. Well, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and the, the irony of sort of criticizing indiscriminate bomb throwing or grenade throwing while throwing grenades that you're not sure who he's aiming at. Like that's what indiscriminate yeah, means. It's like, we don't, we don't know who we're talking about. And it was, it was striking um, because he did say at one point, I don't think that voice, so he, he used that, he wouldn't even name, yeah. he didn't name Doug, but he sort of referred to that voice and um, should be having an influence or something to that effect. And so it was clear what, who he's trying to differentiate from. And, and again, the, the, you, your question was a setup for him to do something like this, you, you know, because you set it up with a, um, hey, you're, you're gracious in disagreement, you'll stick to your guns, but you're, but you're charitable like, we just, like you just were with Keller. What do you think about Moscow Mood? It would have been a fantastic opportunity for him to say something like, you know, uh, those guys do a lot of different things out there, and and uh, you know they you know uh, there's great stuff on marriage and family or something, and, do, and pay a compliment and say, but I don't really like the way that they conduct themselves. It's sure. not my thing. And he could have done that and then moved on, but he kept circling back to it because differentiating from us was an important thing for him to do. Mm -hmm. It was important for him to say, and and you can think about it this way, um, the. The people that he's willing to share a stage with, so Kellerites, he's he's willing to share a stage with the Kellerites, so he's going to praise Keller. Uh, the frame guys and those sort of theistic mutualists, he would share a stage with, a stage with those guys and have a debate and discussion about oh. the issues. He's not going to share a stage, and he needs to have a reason why. So we've got to be pushed far enough out. And to I, where would, I would share a stage with any of them. With <laughs> any of them. And the same thing's true of like the abolitionists, right? So the, the random shot at the abolitionists at the end, which I'm sure you got grief for as well, um, where, where he said, you know, these abolitionists, where were they for all these years? They just all of a sudden showing up at, at wanting to abolish abortion. Um, he kind of takes a shot at that. And, and it, was a, it was a puzzling one, but it was like there's certain groups that I will not be associated with mm -hmm. and want to put distance. Mm -hmm. And there's others that I want to treat as we're, in the, we're all in the family and, and so forth. So yeah. Eric Mason, even the Theonomist, which was, was funny, is the Theonomist got, you know, they're misguided. They're well-intentioned, but misguided. There was charity there towards the recons because they're dead. Hmm. Let me, critical race theory, one of the, and critical theory in general, but let's be specific here. One of the tenets of critical race theory is race, racism is ubiquitous. If you think it's not there, that's because you're blinded and right. you are part of the problem. And what that does is it trains people to see racism where it's not. Right. Uh, do you think it's possible, leading question alert, <laughs> do you think it's possible that... Uh, from so many years of sort of feeling like you've been pushed to the boundaries of evangelicalism, that you have a bit of a complex and can personalize things that are not personal. Yeah, I, I would say in the abstract, certainly. Sure. Yeah, if, if, if they shoot at you long enough, the next shot that you hear <laughs> might not be aimed at you at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, you may have good reason to believe that but, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark Twain once said, a cat that sits on a hot stove lid will never sit on a hot stove lid again, but neither will it sit on a cold one. You know, yeah. Um, so yeah, if someone fires up their uh, attack machine and I start, my left eye starts to twitch, yeah. I, might be, I, I might be making a mistake mm -hmm. thinking that they're talking about me when they're yeah. not. Yeah. But they usually are, yeah. right? So uh, and and have consistently uh, okay. been. But I, I I think I'm pretty placid and easygoing when it comes to that. I don't I sleep fine. I don't sit up nights worrying yeah. worrying about it. So I would say a complex is not what I, the word I would use. But if something blows up and someone asks me, who do you think he's talking about? Yeah, 
I would probably say, well, yeah, probably me. And, well, there, and one way that it, it would you, you could disprove it if there was if there were people who were willing to accept the invitation, it would sort of put the so so you, part of your question is you guys say there's an, uh, maybe I'll rephrase it. Okay. You guys think there's an embargo? Is that could it just be that it's in your head that you guys okay. that, that you know what I mean? Is is there really concerted efforts to make sure that Moscow stays quarantined? Okay. Um, and it's like, well, it, maybe it's just in our heads. I don't think it, I, I wouldn't say that, but an easy way to disprove it would is be to lift the embargo. Would, if somebody were yeah. to show up yeah. or I- accept an invitation to discuss anything, sure. then it would sort of be. I did, and I didn't mention earlier, not only do we have people scheduled to come here that have canceled, but I've been invited to various conferences mm-hmm. and then been uninvited. Um, that's so num- that's happened numerous times. And when I'm invited, oftentimes I'll say, hey, uh, thank you for the invitation. Why don't you look a few things up on the Internet first? <laughs> yeah, are you really <laughs> sure? <laughs> right. Yeah. Are you really sure? But you, um, have to, you also have to understand, it's not, you, like, I'll just say this on his behalf, he's not offended by it. Yeah. Like, it, like again, it, it's not, like, so yeah. sometimes I think people hear that and they go, you're trying to, you're painting yourself as a victim, you're trying to get empathy. It's like, that's the last thing. You know, yeah, that's, that, there's, no, there's none of that. Yeah. Icky empathy. Icky empathy. <laughs> I, uh, well, I guess the only reason I asked that is because I, in the moment, I, I didn't even for a second think that those comments were directed at you guys. It wasn't until the backlash on the internet hmm. that I went, oh, okay, I see how people got there. But in the moment, I thought, well, certainly he's talking about the way people have... The Moscow mood has sort of just become a label for people who are sarcastic, combative, so on and so forth. The, on the theological internet. alt-right, sort of. Okay, so we're going to talk about that later, but I guess we'll talk about it now. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you believe in the woke right? The woke right? The woke right. Like the, basically the equivalent of the woke left, but the, the, the dissident right guys? Yeah, that you yeah. Mean? think about G.K. Beale, sort of you become what you behold. You know, you spend so much time interacting with the woke that you begin to mimic their tactics. Well, you I, know? Um, I would say there's... I wouldn't say mimicking their tactics, although there is some of that. Yeah. Um, I would say that, uh, and this is something I'm actually quite concerned about on the right, is identity politics yes. is very much a danger on the right. Yes. But, okay. We don't uh, want to just do it better than them. Right. Well, which they, is what well, a lot they, of people on the right are doing. Uh, th- these are people who have been taunted their entire adult lives for being white. Uh huh. Okay, and and finally they say, okay, I can't do anything about it. I might as well be proud of it. Uh, so uh, so uh, I might as well embrace it, and uh, I'll take a page from your book. And uh, there is not, not your book. Uh, a page from the yeah. uh, the woke left. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so I'll take a page from um, Saul Alinsky. Mm. Uh, I'll take I'll take a page from those guys, and I'm going to be white and proud. I'm going to start hating Jews. Mm. I'm going to start yeah. you know I'm going to start right. doing the thing. And that is a big concern of mine, and I regard it as almost entirely the creation of the left. Oh, yeah. Right. right. They, they yeah. invented it. They, um, well, but can you fill out the almost? Almost entirely? Yeah. Oh, I think a bunch of it comes from Adam. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. In right. other words, everybody's a sinner. And uh, uh, so basically, vain philosophies oftentimes grease the skids. Yeah. But we don't really need help coming up with sin. A lot of this, a lot of the agitation on the right is envy driven and envy is something we get from Adam. Right. The material and the lies and the stories that are told we can get from the propagandist. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, uh, two more factors that I might add to that. Although, you know, good base level foundational sin stuff there. We'll keep that uh, it, I think whenever you spend so much time engaging with people in a particular battle, it's just so easy for the way that they do battle to become the way that you do battle. Yeah, fight fire with fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. Right. And Jesus kind of said to do the opposite of that. There's a guy. There's a guy on the right, Kurt Schlichter, who's got a tagline that he addresses to the liberals. He said, y- "You're not going to like the new rules." Mm. You invented the, you invented these new rules, and we're coming back at you, and we're going to use your rules to come after you, and you're not going to like uh, yeah. the old blues song. It ain't no fun when the rabbit's got the gun. That, <laughs> that's what we're looking at okay. here. I think. Yep. Uh, many moons ago, Russell Berger and I on Defending Confirm did a podcast series against critical theory. 
proper and then all the manifestations thereof, queer theory, fat theory, every theory, uh, critical pedagogy. But then our last episode in the series was uh, a word to those with whom we agree. Be careful. Be careful. You can oppose wokeness in a way that is unbecoming of Christ. Right. We took a lot of heat for that mm -hmm. uh, because they were very happy when we were going, yeah, woke is bad and woke is bad. And they should be happy when we say that. But when we gave that last little bit of warning, you know, uh, right. we caught a lot of flack for that. Yeah. Do, have you had any of that in your ministry where you where you have uh, not the flack, excuse me. Have you done any of that? Like, don't fight fire with fire. Have Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. Oh. Man, uh, <laughs> I've said over and over to people, don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. Don't take the bait uh, on the anti-Semitism, which is starting to manifest yes. itself yep. on, on the right. I've been uh, fighting that tooth and nail. And uh, a lot of people are, have sort of, res a lot of people on the right have responded with an okay boomer kind of thing. You're, you're a boomer con, you're a Reaganite, you're, you're that kind of conservative. We are very grateful to you for the decades of service you put in and we'll take it from here. It's, yeah. it's time to take grandpa's car keys. William uh, Wolf kind of reminds me of that. And his, I think he stood up at one of your events and asked you a question that, anyways, yes. go ahead. Yeah, he was at uh, one of the events, but he's, yeah. Yeah. but he's, uh, no, I think he's real warm. Yeah, no, and, Has he and, been warm? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. And, and he wouldn't. And William's a, a, a personal friend of mine. I'm not trying to talk bad about yeah. him, but he no. basically, you said, hey, the ship's going down. And he was like, that's defeatist. <laughs> right? right? I mean, anyways. Yep. Yeah. So basically. But yeah, we, 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 we've issued the warnings and, um, and while, while recognizing the, the different threat levels posed by these, which is the, the, the no enemies to the right discussion of we're not going to reactively cancel people to the right just because the left starts calling names. Okay. We know how that works. The, so some, some of the, even the back to the question of death by a thousand cuts, um, at some point people have to realize if, if you get used to putting daylight between you and another Christian over lies, it'll just get used on you. You're incentivizing the thing. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a real need for, um, if it's not true, that's when you want to put your arm around and this is a Christian, this is a brother and not put the distance because right. it's because you're trying to save your credibility with mm -hmm. people who are willing to lie about everybody. Mm -hmm. And who are never going to give you that credibility anyway. Right. right. Yeah. Chase that as long as you want. Uh, can I read you guys two quotes from a pastor friend who is generally sympathetic to you guys? He watched uh, a recent video and he, he wrote these uh, and, and, and I asked him, I said, hey, that's a really good question, I think. Can I just read that in the interview? And he said, yeah. So he defends mockery, but missed the real issue. I think he would be you. Uh, Doug defends mockery, but missed the real issue, which is his loose tribe of online followers uh, treat other Christians as the enemies of the truth with their mockery. Let's, let's stop there. Let's do the first one. I think one of the fair critiques that I've heard against Moscow is not that mockery or sarcasm is in itself sinful, but it, it is more often than not aimed at true brothers in Christ in a way that's unhelpful rather than being aimed at uh, people outside of the flock. Thoughts on that? Well, I would say scripturally, the people who are targets of scriptural mockery are almost always religious leaders mm -hmm. within the covenant. Right. So, okay. so um, now we're getting back into a little bit of the... Yeah. So, Phar Pharisees, Sadducees. Yeah. yeah the, um, so the religious... When Jesus... Um, in Jesus' day, there were about 6,000 Pharisees. They were the most respected religious group in Israel until Jesus got done with them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jesus just savaged them, and nobody calls their group uh, a resurgent Phariseeism. He, he just wrecked that. Um, uh, and I think that Ezra was probably the first Pharisee you know, of mm -hmm. the scribal tradition that... Um, that began studying the law. And so I think, um, and if you look at the etymology of the word, Pharisaism is very close to Puritanism. It's the same kind of, it was the same kind of movement. And I think when Pharisaism began, it was a noble thing and it went to seed. And then Puritanism, I think was a noble thing, one of the best things ever. And then there are Puritanical types downstream, it went to seed. And so when Jesus went after the, 
uh, the people, he, he, what, what was he going after? He was going after the broadness of their phylacteries, the length of their robes, how long they prayed, how they gave alms, all religious things, right? He, mm. he, that's, yeah. that's biblical. Uh, but, but didn't Jesus basically say that they were sons of hell? Right, yeah. and members of the covenant. Yeah, so, so again, I guess that's where we're going back to a little bit of a Presbyterian distinction, but like when, when you mock and slander someone who hasn't lost the yep. gospel. Well, slander is oh, sorry, sorry, fault. No, sorry, 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 no, no, <laughs> the other S word, uh, S-H-I, no. Uh, satire. But, yeah, mo mocking satire, sarcasm. Uh, you guys do that against people who haven't abandoned the gospel, who aren't Pharisees, who aren't sons of hell. They just, you know, they might have different cultural impulses. Yeah, so this is where I would put, so the, the mockery and satire, the, the, the faithful biblical kind, is a form of rebuke, okay? And it operates on a dimmer switch. So um, when you're dealing with someone that you think is actually not a Christian, it gets turned up to 11, uh -huh. and Jesus does, you sons of hell, that sort of thing. But at a smaller level, it can be used for a more mild rebuke. Hey, knock it off, idiot. Like, right, so it's that sort of thing. But the dimmer switch means if you, if you, if you see satire, mockery, caricature as legitimate tools for rebuking sin and folly, and you just need to grade it up, then when it comes to the, the way that we try to use it, it's we try to a, a, a appropriately dish it out. The interesting thing about your question, though, was to say mockery, you know, mockery and satire and dismissiveness um, is inappropriate against other Christians. That's what Ligon was doing in the interview. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, like, so, and 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 the, the interesting thing about it is, I would, I don't actually object to his use of it, right? Mm -hmm. to, to caricature, to say, you know, this is what they're doing, and to and to draw, um, you know, to, to draw us with big ears because we have big ears as a caricature is a legitimate. Ta Jesus does it. Um, camel going through the eye of needle hyperbole, the prophets do it. Um, it's a legitimate tactic. The interesting, the, the, the thing I objected to was criticizing that tactic while using it. Sure, but, and, but apart from Lig, just yeah, apart in general. From, apart yeah. from Lig, go, go to this. When Jesus attacks the Pharisees and savages them, mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't name any individual Pharisee. The, the close, uh, he just doesn't name them. He's, he is talking about a particular movement and describes them a particular way. The way, yeah. uh, if I did, um, uh, talking about charismatic, a charismatic church, and let's say I called it Knee Deep in Glory Worship Center, all right? <laughs> or let's You're say- You're good, man. That's why you, that's why you keep <laughs> yeah. reading even if you don't yeah. agree. Right, so um, <laughs> Jesus is uh, categorizing a group a particular way. It's a caricature of a group. So if I were a cartoonist and I wanted to draw a picture of a anti-nuke protest, and I drew a picture of a hippie chick lady and beads and uh, wireless gl glasses and a tie-dye shirt. Um, everybody would know that I was drawing a liberal uh, peacenik, right? But I'm not picking on any individual, right? right? Okay. And, but people who fit that description, who fit in that caricature, would feel affronted. But I'm not, when, when I talk about uh, evangelical goo churches or Orthodoxy, you know, reformed orthodoxy churches, mm -hmm. or charismatic, uh, knee deep in glory, that that kind of thing. Yeah. There are numerous occasions where, the sh if the shoe fits, wear sure. it. Sure. But I'm not attacking any particular brother in Christ. What about your comment against Russell Moore in your most recent, no, what is it called, No Quarter November? Okay, which one? Which uh, one? <laughs> we've been <laughs> we've been doing this about? since before. Uh, 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 Russ Moore trying to raise money. It was in the it was in yeah. the trailer. Oh, oh, in the trailer. In the trailer. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. R raising so, money for the year, I'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, yeah. So, you, so you named Russell Moore. I named Russell Moore. I'm, yeah, I'm just because you were saying like, yeah, I'm speaking generalities. And by the way, I think you're at your best when you are doing that. But 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 sometimes you don't though. Right. So with Russell Moore raising, I think it was Russell Moore raising money for the year I'll see. Year I'll see. And I was talking about uh, being cautious. I think yeah. at that moment. Yeah. All I did was name him. You don't think you mocked him? For what? Uh, well, dang, now I feel like I should have watched it before I came <laughs> to this interview. Uh, in the moment, it felt like, ooh, he took a shot at Russ Moore. No, I, I named him, and it, basically what, what I did was I implied that we are on different teams. As, as we're approaching this cultural moment, his approach is very, very different from our approach. The, the, I was making a distinction between his approach and our approach 
where we're kind of out there, um, you know, with the flamethrower, sure. and he's doing something very cautious and mild. Yeah. But gotcha. it was, you know, not a big shot. I okay. Fairly mild. Yeah, it was real mild. Okay. Real uh, mild. Se second quote. This is the dilemma for people like me. The way Doug talks here about evangelicals responding to COVID and CRT makes me want to align with Moscow. Uh, but in practice, the way his tribe mocks and scorns those Christians on the other side makes me want nothing to do with them. <clears throat> it's almost like when you share edgy humor with kids and they go out in public and immediately use the same jokes in inappropriate ways and offend everyone by imitating their dad. Right. That, yes. that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. That is good. <laughs> and it's a real problem. Yeah. So um, when I've written on satire, one of the things I've done is I've written 21 principles for a satiric writer. What okay. should, what Give should him he, the guardrails. Yeah, what are the guardrails? Yeah. What are the principles? Right. And I have no doubt <laughs> that there are people who take their inspiration from me. They're 19 years old. They read a couple of um, my blog posts and then go home and make fun of their mom, right? Well, they shouldn't do that. Yeah, right. They, um, I'm not in favor of that. They shouldn't do it. And in that they, case, they're they're doing it despite your stated. You're like they're not actually imitating you right. because you said do it this way with these boundaries, and they blew past the boundaries. And so, at that point, like there is an element of like, um, people people are going to sin, and uh -huh. you and you can issue the exhortations, and you can do all that you can do, yeah. but we don't, there's, it, it, other than if they were in our church yeah. where we might have some, you know, yeah. discipline, if somebody, if, uh -huh. so, if it was somebody in our church, and, and I'll say this, that's happened. There have been times when church members have gotten feisty online in ways that were unhelpful, and they'll get a text from their elder saying, hey, cool it, we don't, we don't, well, need, wish, we don't need your help. I wish that elder would text some of the people who have been from your church attacking me online. <laughs> <laughs> well, so from... Well, it's from our church. Or and from by the way, I hope I don't, I'm not trying to sound no, like a victim. No, no, I'm no, trying no, to be no. funny. Okay. No, no, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, it's true, it's, but <laughs> if, if they're from our church, it, that it'd be worth us knowing about yeah, that. If yeah. it's, so basically if someone's under our care, yeah. pastoral care, and they are off the leash online, okay. that's something we pastor. Okay. So if, if we're responsible yep. for them um, and someone said, Hey, so-and-so is out there going after, so th they will get a note or someone will check in with them. That's yeah. something we care about. Okay. Uh, if someone in South Carolina is doing that, and I don't know anything about it, and I don't know who he is, right. but he claims he's inspired by me, um, yeah, that's a, a world's a fallen place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> help, help me think through this. This is a legitimate question. Um, on, on the one hand, you, you know that, the, that you're influencing people to, at minimum, embrace mockery, sarcasm, so on and so forth. But you're trying to put up all the right guardrails. You're trying mm -hmm. to do that on top of a solid foundation. But you know it's going to go awry. Yeah. Where do you uh, accept responsibility, or how do you accept responsibility when it does? I, so I'd I'd flip this around and okay. just to, to to get to take it out of the mockery thing, and put it in someplace else and sure. see what would you do. Yeah. So say you were going to write a book encouraging people to be gentle and lowly. Just for example. Just for, just for example. Say <laughs> someone wrote a book like that. Okay. Um, and let's say that you put up guardrails saying, of course, we know that Jesus wasn't always gentle and lowly, yeah. but also had a harder... And, and you said, and you acknowledged um, this is one form and it's directed towards confused sheep and sheep without a shepherd and so forth. Yeah, yeah. But to, sh to wolves, he came down hard. Yeah. And then somebody then took your book, Gentle and Lowly, and decided to, to go all woke and let in all the wolves in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said, look what you did. Mm -hmm. And you said, no, no, I said that you ought to fight the wolves and mm -hmm. you ought to draw the lines and we got to be clear. But then within that, we love and we show compassion and mm -hmm. care. I'd say to that in that situation, then you did your, you fulfilled your duty. You put up the guardrails and somebody else jumped over them in order to do what they were going to do. And nobody, it's funny how it's on this issue, it's on the use of mockery where people raise this question, but mm -hmm. not in the other place. In a cult, it's, this is the fire. This is Lewis's statement about we're always prone to bring a fire extinguisher to a flood, mm -hmm. right? Um, and if you look around, one of my questions when people have acknowledged, as you did at the beginning, um, you know, everybody acknowledges that mockery and satire have a place in the biblical storyline. Mm -hmm. Prophets did it, Jesus did it, mm -hmm. Paul did it, so it has its place. But nevertheless, here's the here's the hard question for you. It's like, well, where are the other people? Is anybody else, other than, say, the Babylon Bee, 
faithfully doing it, att yeah. even attempting to do it? Yeah. Or is it sort of like this is the this is the one um, sword in the arsenal that never gets brought out? We but never. Why do you think some few people decide to use this tool? Because because it's so effective. It is truly effective. It really gets in people's midst, and then they counterattack. If you if you start shooting live ammo, you're going to get return fire. Uh -huh. That and we have been the recipients of return fire for a long, long time. And on this question, I, here's another illustration. I've taught many classes, uh, classroom uh, things, and I've I've given superlative grades to many students over the years, and I've flunked many students over the years. I don't feel responsible for the students I flunked. Right. Th because they didn't do the work. Yeah. They didn't do what I said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I assigned this and they didn't write the paper. I assigned that. So when student when people are out there imitating me and they're flunking the course, they're yeah. not doing anything I said. Their worst Doug Wilson impersonation. Yeah. 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 Right. That's a, John Dewey, not that I want to quote him with appreciation too much, but John Dewey once said, Lord, deliver me from my disciples. Yeah. So so there are, there's a co cohort of disciples that are in my name doing things that if they were taking a class from me on how to do it, I would be flunking them, and, but they're not in my class. Yeah. And so I, I don't feel responsible. And this is the next thing. Uh, I, there's a chapter on this in Mere Christendom. Uh, it's the chapter on Jesus mobs. When, when you look at the, the Jerusalem in the first century, that place was a powder keg. It was ready to go up at any moment. And the reason they had to arrest Jesus at night is because they were afraid of the crowds. And it says this numerous places. Uh, the, the, the religious leaders were afraid of the crowds. And then in Acts, when they go to arrest the disciples, the apostles, they, they brought them very gingerly because they were afraid the crowd was going to stone them. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very clear that the, these crowds had not gotten the Sermon on the Mount memo. They, they were like radical Trump supporters. Yeah, right, okay. they, they were ready to, ready to start a revolution. Mm -hmm. they, they were the people who listened to Jesus' teaching and got it. And there were people who were in favor of Jesus, had been baptized by John, but who had maybe one third of what, you know, yeah. maybe heard a parable or something. And they were hopping mad at the Romans and hop, hopping mad at the the Jewish uh, compromisers that were working with the Romans, and they were an angry, seething mob, Okay, right? And in that moment, Jesus went up to the temple and started flipping tables. Now, is Jesus responsible for what the mayhem that might happen if a riot broke out? Or, or So Jesus was not pouring oil on troubled waters. Jesus went to Jerusalem. He knew what was going to happen in Jerusalem, he arranged to, uh, he went up to the temple complex to touch their eyeball and, and did this in a very provocative way, got arrested and was railroaded in the middle of the night. And he did it in a, in a time when there were multitudes of people who would have taken his name and done it all wrong, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and well, that welcome to earth, kid, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, right. <laughs> that's just simply the way it is. Uh, if you if you're George Whitfield, uh, you're preaching a great you're a great revivalist. Is there going to be some 19 year old kid who wants to be a great revival preacher for all the wrong reasons? For all the wrong yeah. reasons and, and use all kinds right. of tactics you'd never use, yeah. but is going to come behind you and sort of claim your name? It's like yeah, that's gonna that's gonna happen, and there's no way to avoid it. Well, what would you say to someone like me who says in a vacuum, I agree? with everything that you've said about the serrated edge. Great little booklet, by the way. It's also on audiobook. If any of our listeners or viewers want to check it out, it's very good. If you want to kind of hear the whole right. theory behind all this. Uh, but somebody who says, okay, in a vacuum, I understand that. For me personally, I'm so afraid that I won't use that serrated edge wisely and I'll end up hurting people more than helping people. Would you say I need to kind of just like, no, nah, learn how to do it, bro? Or yeah. like, no, yeah, no stick no. with that impulse. No, so learn how to do it. Because this goes back to your gentle and he lowly. He said no. You said yes. Well, well I, yes and no. Yes. Yeah, there, there's a yes, yes and, and no. no. A it little bit of nuance here. A, yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, total, nu to, total <laughs> nuance. Complex things need Very complex. So, complex. Yeah. Uh, Let's get clear. The gentle and lowly point. Um, are people who are afraid of being too acerbic or too polemical or too belligerent, things that an elder must not be. An elder must not be a brawler, must not be a striker, 
we want to be um, fit the qualifications of First Timothy three and Titus one, um, and so they concentrate on being loving and kind and gentle. And I I say, okay, is there no pathology associated with those vir- those virtues? Can they go pathology wrong? meaning it can go sideways badly yeah. badly wrong? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Not only can it go badly wrong, but it is doing so all right. over North America. Right now. Mm-hmm. It's destroying the church. The West, yeah. Right? Uh, it's, it, it is the flood, yeah. and, and people saying, you can't have too much satire. That's the fire extinguisher. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know of you, if we went out and tried to round up all the churches that are being torn apart because their pastor is too acerbic when he addresses the sins of the age. Would come up with maybe 10 Mm. Right. If we had to round up all the churches that are rotting out from the inside because of empathy, because of nuance, because of all the things that they've they've compromised Tolerated, on. Yeah. And, and these are all virtues that have that have become leprous. Mm. The, the, you know, really kindness really is a virtue. Gentleness really is a virtue. Yeah. Uh, and one of the reasons why people don't want to come here is they don't want to see how happy our wives are. <laughs> yeah, and, we'll kinda... and they don't want to see that it's a community where people love each other and they sacrifice for each other. It's not like we make fun of each other 24 right. seven all the time. Um, it's just, it's a small fraction of what we do. Yeah. And uh, but we but we reserve the right to pull that that tool out of the tool chest in the appropriate biblical yeah. setting. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> and the kindness and the gentleness and the goodness, all of that is the screaming threat to the church today. We are way too nice. We are dying of nice. We are being conquered because we're nice. We're being conquered because we want to be winsome no matter what. Winsome to the devil? What? Yeah. My no was basically because of, um, in the book of Acts, you, or, or in, throughout, the, throughout the, the scriptures, there's lots of leaders who use the tool but the people aren't necessarily expected to use the tool. They're, suspe- they're expected to laugh at it or to amen it. So Paul says, you su- tell, tells Elymas the magician, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. He doesn't need everybody in the crowd to start chanting it. He just needs the people to say amen to it. So there is a, so I want, so some of what I want to do is relieve the burden that like a, a normal church member, so you're a pastor, so that's, there's a little bit of a difference uh-huh. there. You need to have, a, have all the tools sharpened in your tool belt that you can from the compassion in the counseling room um, and from the pulpit to the serrated edge whenever it's called for. But for a lay person, the call on their life is not necessarily to be, you know, using the serrated yeah. edge all the time. Using the prophetic but, but tool. They, but they need to know when they should say amen to it, okay. that, they, that they should nod along. Uh, Doug, a lot of the feedback that I've got, I, I got, actually got an email yesterday from a pretty... I don't know, I guess moderately well-known discernment blogger type guy who basically said, watch the interview, not, not, not happy with it. Lig slandered these brothers. And I think you are complicit in that as well. And, uh, you know, I, I was part of the slander. So I just wanted to give, give you guys a chance to maybe uh, address me directly if you have any concerns with, I'm happy to no. repent of anything no, you think I, no, I should. I, I would say everything you, everything you needed to do in that interview you're doing by being here. Right. Yeah. This, right. Is, this is a Proverbs 18, 17 situation. If you had done that interview and then we invited you to do something like this and you had refused, mm-hmm. then he would have a point. Right. Right. Because yeah. you would have heard one side, it would have been lopsided. Um, but the fact that you're willing yeah. to fly up here, which takes some doing. <laughs> Maybe nobody comes to your conferences <laughs> just because it's so hard to get here. <laughs> Anyways, go ahead, brother. Sorry. So we, um, so we have, the fact that you're here indicates to me that your, your interest is, to ha- is true balance and clarity. Yeah, I think so. So, so basically, yeah, yeah um, any concerns I might have had are resolved by, yeah. by this. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also uh, something in- watching, watching yourself back in an interview is, is revealing. A lot of times I'll, f- I'll find myself listening to someone with whom I agree or disagree and just making a lot of noises, trying to be an engaged, yeah. active listener. And that can even bother people, you know, yeah. like you were yesing and amening. Um, yeah, right. you, I think I just do that. A bunch I'm, of that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm trying to. No, so I, I'm, I, I'm a teacher. This is a bad, this is a, it's a habit. And I've had to actually work on it for yeah. myself because I've had people say it to me, which is um, with students when they're, when I ask them a question in class and they answer it, 
I'll often nod along and say mm-hmm. yes because I'm trying to encourage them. I'm, I'm tracking with you. I'm following you. I understand. They may be saying something really stupid, but I'm nodding along because I'm wanting to draw them out. Well, if you get in the habit of that in a classroom over 20 years, yeah. then you're in an, another setting where you probably should not be doing the encouragement thing like in an interview where you should ask your questions and step out of it and let that guy talk, and then you can follow up and point out the disagreements. But I just have the habit of doing it. So I, t- yeah. I think it's a totally normal thing. Your wife probably really appreciates it. <laughs> yeah, well, she does it until I do it to yeah, people. Yeah. She's like, why were you agreeing with him? I'm like, I wasn't. I, I was wasn't. just yeah. understanding Active him. listening. Uh, last little thing on this, and then we'll move on. Uh, in the wake of... <laughs> I'm, act, I'm, I'm listing these out because I think it's pretty funny. In the wake of the interview, uh, people who are upset about it have called me gay, low test, cowardly. They've said that I'm castrated, a liberal, that I'm deceptive intentionally, so on. Um, what would you say to people who have tried to defend your honor like that? And I guess it's not just towards me. I would it's towards say Lincoln. that's not the way. <laughs> that's not the way. <laughs> pretty simple, right? You don't yeah. know. That's not the way. Don't do that. uh, No, I would stop that. (laughs) No, I would say further. It's not like okay, you did something that the Bible says you shouldn't do. I would say that. Okay. But I would also say, and you're not helping. Right. Right. You um, the cause that the 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 offense that you took on our behalf, and you came, you rushed in to defend us. It it set us back. It's it's Mm. not it's not helping if you come unstuck. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's reactive. So like, the, you know, back to that point. So strategically, it's a bad yeah, idea. Yeah. And it's a bad habit, bad right? Habit. So it's okay. a, and a blunder. You're, you're, okay. you're, you're cultivating in yourself the habit of somebody does something and you just react to it. And it's like, that's the problem. We, you need sober-minded people who can actually think clearly and act wisely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, we've covered a lot of these questions that I have written down because we got ahead of ourselves. Uh, before we move on, I just want to say uh, I'm not like best friends with Lig. I've interviewed him twice, yeah. and one of his best friends is one of my best friends, and that's about it. But I do love the brother, and I think the way that people have spoken about him after the interview is is not okay. Uh, to, to write a man's ministry off for perhaps speaking uncharitably and unclearly, uh, if, if you think that that's what he did, to say uh, just the other day somebody uh, on a YouTube comment on the on the thing, you know, this guy doesn't believe the Bible. He shouldn't be in ministry. To say that about Lig Duncan, who's been faithfully ministering the gospel for 40 years, you know, I, I, I've never said that about you guys when I disagreed right. with you. When Thabiti started going off the rails, I didn't say that about him, you know? Right. Uh, maybe I showed the, my hand a little too much there. But no, no. Here, think of it this way. Um, th- uh, those comments are comments that I think um, are to be regretted. Okay, you, do, you okay. don't go after... People on a personal level yeah. calling them names. Yeah. It shouldn't be scurrilous. What, it's what's the, what's scurrilous. that word mean? It shouldn't be. You shouldn't be throwing rotten vegetables and dead cats um, <laughs> okay. at, at someone because they did something. You should engage with the point. Yeah. Um, so all of that yeah. uh, that is um, a given. Okay. But I think that the the fact that you, it happened to you, people were attacking Lig. I will say one of our parishioners. Um, piled into one comment thread, I think, on Facebook and said, hey, with all the stuff about Lig, and I agree with he shouldn't have done it, but please remember the fifth commandment. Praise yeah. God. Right. So, yeah. Praise God. So that, and, uh, and for us, like, we'd, we'd happily, like, if, if we could get on a stage, we would. Have that conversation. And, or yeah. if we could get in a room, you know, like we'd, um, there's no bad blood. Yeah. There's we'd disagreement. Serve the Lord's supper to him. Yeah. We'd host him. We'd, sure. Uh, yeah. So yeah. all of that. Yeah. So the people who are... Uh, descending into personal abuse mm-hmm. are not representing us. Okay. Right. Okay. And I would say that, that those people have a problem that they need to address with God. Okay. But there is a. I want to zoom out and say okay. there's also a larger cultural problem, mm-hmm. and that cultural problem is that we are that we have a population in America where the rank and file normies are beyond exasperated. We are we oh, yeah. are on the verge of civil war, so yeah. uh, so the thing the kind of thing that I'm afraid. You really of, mean that? Oh, I, yeah, yeah right. absolutely, absolutely mean it. And the the kind of thing when people come unstuck in a in a YouTube comment thread, which is that's what you do there. But, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. But, uh, I'm trying to learn the customs of your people. Yeah, <laughs> sociologists. People who do that. That's quite honestly, that's the least of our worries. 
Right. Um, th that's the that's the uh, canary in the mine. That's the initial indicators that we are hanging by a thread. Yeah. And uh, I've got much I've got much bigger fish. To yeah. Fry. It's a symptom, not a. It's a symptom, yeah. not the root problem. Yeah, the right. root problem is that we're dealing with two Americas. Um, uh, the the one one America is at war with normal. Uh -huh. As it is at war with God's natural revelation, God's special revelation, the way God assigned us our chromosomes. The, the, there's a, a section of the country, many of them in positions of influence and power, who are hell bent on jamming that down everybody's throats. And the people who are um, reacting this way are reacting because they have not been equipped by their pastors. They've not been taught by their pastors mm -hmm. how to react. Mm -hmm. They've not been equipped in worldview thinking. They've, all they know is that everything is going desperately, terribly <clears throat> wrong. Everything I loved is going away. Mm -hmm. And everywhere I look, evangelical leaders are compromising yeah. with it. So just to go back to the earlier point about the word nuance, because this is where we are. Yeah. Um, the last 15 people that this Joe Schmo heard use the word nuance mm -hmm. were part of this great betrayal. Now they're gay. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah, right. Yeah, it's part of the great betrayal. Yeah. And then you come on and you're not doing that. Yeah. But they lump you in with it. Yeah, and I'm like, guys, I don't want to let the left have the word nuance. Right. right. Just like I don't want them to have the word justice. Right. It's not their word, right. it's but, my but, word. But I would say, yes, but you have to... There, but you have to recognize the world you're living in. Right, yeah. if there are 12 clowns in a circus ring and they're cavorting and doing somersaults, yeah. you can get down there and, sh and start quoting Shakespeare, but to the audience, you're the 13th clown. Right. And there's, and Did you, you just think of that? No, that, no it, I've used it, it before. Years. You're like, you must have... If you put all these in a book, the world would have not <laughs> enough room for all of them. All right. So ba it, basically, yeah. to the audience, you're the 13th clown yeah. because you have to have the, you have to have the gravitas to be able to change the whole circus, right? Yeah. So you can't just do a, a podcast that's self-contained. Sure. In the in the circus that's going on. Yeah. And if something catches fire, you know, if, like yeah. uh, Alistair, um, um, Beg. 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 Alistair Begg's thing. Yeah. He did this thing. Yeah. And it catches fire. Yeah. Or Nancy's spanking video. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. catches fire and you you never know what it is that's going to catch fire yeah. and go yeah. and when it catches fire and goes the the volatility of the population is the problem and that has been the direct result of concerted long-term strategy on the part of the left right. sure and and we need to attack that we we need to get out there more time attacking well, that than a, the and, symptoms and i think i think one thing on on those reactions to bring in the fifth commandment, some of what was going on there is you have a bunch of people who have benefited for the last 20 plus years from, say, Doug's ministry in equipping them, in helping them to parent, in helping them to think clearly about the world. They've benefited greatly, and then it looked like Lig just insulted their dad. Yeah, right. Right, mm -hmm. and just, like like took cheap took cheap shots at at their their dad, and so all of the defensiveness that you would feel in that comes blurting out mm -hmm. in a place in a, in anonymity. Right, yeah. and yeah, so it's like, and so it's the sort of um, there. There's me kind of trying to understand where it's coming from, yeah. and still want to say, don't, don't be do a that. don't be yeah. a 12 year old who's you know fighting because somebody said something about your dad. Peace, Eustace. Do not scold like a kitchen girl. Yeah, right. No warrior scolds. <laughs> no warrior. Shakespeare. Scolds. <laughs> Narnia. Narnia. <laughs> Last battle. Um, okay, this question comes from a mutual friend. I texted him today and I said, Hey, uh, I know that you love and support these guys. But I also know that you're a straight shooter. What is one question in the vein of a critique that you think I should be sure to ask? So here's what he sent me. Is there anything at all in DeYoung's Moscow Mood article that makes you think maybe he's got a point here? Is there anything at all to acknowledge as a fair critique that you could learn from? I would say he absolutely has a point, not maybe has a point. Okay. But this goes back to what we, I was saying earlier about speaking to tens of thousands of people. Okay. So the things that he's describing and the reactions that he's, possible reactions to things that we do, I don't have any doubt at all that he's seen those sorts of things with his own eyes, right? Okay. So, so um, I'm not, I wouldn't dispute the facts of the case. So, so um, this uh, may be the attribution 
Well, no, it's what it has to do is if there's 10,000 people and 150 of them reacted in this way, 1,200 reacted in this way, and remember the, the target, who, who, am I, who am I writing for? Okay, I've got one person in mind, and I've had that person in mind for three deca decades or more. This is who I'm always writing for. Um, and Kevin DeYoung is not necessarily, he's not, under no obligation to write for my audience. He's writing for his audience, mm -hmm. right? And, and when what I say lands wrong with someone I wasn't writing for, that might be a collateral damage thing that I regret, or it might, I might not mind ticking that person off, but I'm not, I was not attempting that. When he says, here's a the, here's the problem with what Wilson's doing, and he describes what's happening over here, I don't have any problem accepting that. Yes, I, I think that it's not just maybe he has a point. I think he certainly has a point. That was a lot. Could you, could you in more succinctly say so that? Think about it this way. If, if you've got a target audience, so Kevin has a target audience that he's trying to encourage and strengthen. And in trying to encourage and strengthen that audience, say he alienates a different one, uh -huh. and then we criticized him for the alienation. Uh -huh. Look, you alienated this person. Yeah. Aren't, do you, do, don't you would you, just say, okay, yeah, he, we he, did. The, the, we weren't the, trying to, yeah, but we yeah, did. Yeah, that, that, that was a, in some cases, it's an unfortunate byproduct. In some cases, it was part of the point. So you, you actually do roll the grenade in there because you want it to blow up because the, the reaction is actually what helps other people see what's going on. Okay, on that note, my next question about the obligatory nature of debate. Uh, in your guys' follow-up video to the article, you guys said the ball's in play. You, yeah. don't, you don't get to throw the ball into the field and say, uh, you, know, brr, you know, ball's not in play, ball's in play. I'm not so sure that that's true. Here, here's my thoughts on it. You guys critique me, give me pushback. Yeah. I think it is at least valid to say I don't support the, the sort of Moscow mood project. Um, and I think that the way that the project continues to gain steam is through kerfuffles, you know. So therefore, strategically, I don't want to have a back and forth. I don't want to do a debate. I'm not trying to, I'm not actually trying to like, win over Doug Wilson or, or the Mosco, Mo, Mo, Moscovites. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm actually just trying to warn people sort of more broadly to like be careful of this. And I kind of don't care whether or not they want to engage in it. That's not really what I'm trying to do here. Right. Thoughts on Except, that? Yeah, the thought would be um, we have not grown and expanded our influence because of the kerfluffles. We've grown and expanded our influence by steadily doing what we do and being, and being ignored and shut out. Okay, but, but, but let's just say that you were to grant him that, to say, like, I think that that is one of the main planks in their strategies, and I don't want to give that to them. I mean, is that fair? Oh, yeah, yeah there's a fair point where that's one of the things that trolls do. That, uh -huh. you don't know, feed if, the trolls. Don't be a troll. Um, if a troll get, gets into a Twitter spat with Elon uh -huh. Musk, that's going to make his day. Yeah. You know? <laughs> he yeah. started with 25 followers, and the, <laughs> yeah. the, he fell into a chocolate pie. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there, there is a universe in which it would be appropriate to say, here are my concerns, everybody be warned, these are, these are the concerns. Yeah. Um, so if you listen to me and respect my judgment, um, that's all I have to say, and I'm not interested in getting into it with um, the Moscow guys. Yeah. Okay, there is a world in which that would be a fair thing to do. Okay. But I don't think that that's the situation we're actually in. Okay. Um, because the when people are at the tennis match, looking at here this way, this way, this way, this way, um, I don't think it's a an effective thing to do. If I were advising Kevin DeYoung, I would say, okay. um, look, I really think you need to have um, a, a discussion with these guys, um, and that and the discussion is going to prove. Uh, established to a bunch of people on our side that you're not semi woke, right? Because the way the when you shut people out, when you don't talk to them, when there's no interaction, and the people on both sides are they've got a numerous enough following, or their ministries are formidable enough to matter, yeah. right? Okay. Um, you and you have the ex you have the exchange 
what you're doing is heading off misunderstandings. The, um, you're, the, what, what would happen is he would be saying, okay, uh, Kevin DeYoung, would, by talking with us, would be acknowledging publicly that we're not orcs, and we would be acknowledging publicly that he's not woke mm -hmm. or, or headed there. Sure. Right? And then peace and harmony would break out, and that's not to certain people's advantage. And, and it's just been within the last year that it's like a memo went out after years and years of my name not being mentioned, my not being retweeted or quoted, years and years and years of that. Within the last year, all of a sudden, Russell Moore names me aspiring theocrat in Christianity mm -hmm. Today. Mm -hmm. The New York Times names me. Kevin DeYoung names me. Uh, the Moscow, you know. It's, Why do you think that is? I think it's because um, our influence has grown to such an extent yeah. that the people in the in the big Eva world or the standard reformed evangelical world are getting asked about us all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think they've realized that um, yeah, they've, got, they've they, got to say something. They, yeah, so it's, um, I think in a lot of places, there's guys who are in that next generation who are like, given that we do actually have orcs out there who are at war with reality, why are we doing this really weird fight thing amongst our, why are certain people embargoed and quarantined when they can be, when they're helpful, or I'm getting help with my, you know, somebody starts recommending a book at one of these churches, like a, a parenting book. And now you've got people who, now it's, it's become an issue. So it's bubbling up from within. So it no longer can be ignored. But the problem is that because they built that wall so high to, again, to make it face to face and to treat it like another brother where you could just have the disagreement and then move on would be to sort of walk back something that they are not in a position to walk back. Doug, I know a man who once said that you are not qualified to be an elder because you're quarrelsome. Yeah. Uh, not that you are mean or mean-spirited, but that there's not a fight that happens in evangelicalism without you kind of always having a comment about it. W what would you say to that? Uh, quarrelsome would be um, when you get into quarrels. Uh, debating is when you get into debates. Okay. So um, quarrelsome would be, um, well, in the First Timothy three and Titus one, mm -hmm. an elder must not be quarrelsome. Uh, must not be quarrelsome. Must not be that way. And I take that very seriously. And don't quarrel with my wife, and don't quarrel with my friends, and don't uh, you know? I'm not. Uh, I don't quarrel with my fellow elders. I don't. You know, it's mm -hmm. it, it's not a part of my disposition, it's not part of my pattern of my life. And when I'm in a debate, it's on, like on, online, it's as though there's a battle and I go to the armory and I get my weapons and I go to the battle and I fight because in the battle with the, uh, the weaponry that God authorizes us to use. And I do fight, right? And then I take the weapons back to the armory and then I go home to my wife and kids and don't quarrel. Right, right. So the, it, I think it would be a, a mistake to take someone's demeanor and attitude on the battlefield as a snapshot of the way they talk to their mom. Is there, is there a battle that you come across that you choose not to enter into the fray of? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah. So if you Because you said, you, you're prolific. You know, yeah. I mean, you're, you're involved in a lot. Right. I, I, I write a lot, but I tell, I tell people that I write, I write for the same reason that dogs bark. I, I just, I love to write. I love to think out loud. I love to, I love to write. And a lot of the writing is not polemical. It's analysis and working through arguments. And, and then if I get attacked, I will answer. And I always try to answer in a way that's commensurate with the kind of attack, right? So there was recently a uh, an article in Themelios about uh, postmillennialism, which I responded to, but it was a friendly response. Um, yeah. You know, um, there's no reason to fight with people you don't want to fight with. Yeah. Right. But if someone is advocating something that I think is dangerous to the flock, I'm a shepherd and shepherds fight. So basically, I, I don't feel uh, bad about fighting at sure. all, yeah. as long as I'm fighting wolves mm -hmm. or fellow shepherds who are letting the wolves in. Yeah. 
Switching gears a little bit, Joe, you on a recent interview had a really interesting take on Big Eva. Can you can you repeat that again? You're you're the yeah, I, just, I think sometimes people make Big Eva into this like really big backroom conspiratorial thing um, when in reality what it is is it's a bunch of guys are friends and that everybody has it. It's just a natural feature where you're friends with someone and therefore you trust their judgment. And so if they say um, you're friends with someone and they say that guy's trouble, you're just going to be inclined to trust them because they're your friends. And that a I'm lot sure of that happens here. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, for sure. Is yeah. he solid? Is he? Yeah. yeah. Is he solid? Any concerns yeah. there that, and so it's, it's a very normal thing. Um, and then the, the reason it has traction though, is because sometimes it's unclear for, for lay people, what the criteria is for why certain people are in and out. Right. So, um, why'd that guy get invited? Why does mm -hmm. he get a pass? Why is that okay? And it begins to look like it's more deliberate and, and people are prone to project more, um, malice than is necessary, that it must be some deep, you know, deep animosity and malice that's animating it mm -hmm. as opposed to simply more informal, friendly sorts of stuff. So that's, I mean, that's, that's what's going on in a lot of the big Eva conversation. No, yeah. Another thing that came up in your, I think Lig said this in the interview, that there are other ministries that are, are way bigger, yeah. way bigger death on more the money. gospel coalition. So why, um, and I would say big Eva is not the biggest. Yeah. And, and, and it's big reformed Eva, very and, small. Yeah, very, very small. But the, the big Eva vibe is, big Eva is, in my mind, the cool kids. Okay. Okay. It's, they're the downstream descendants of young, restless, and reformed. And the, it's, a, it's a coolness vibe. Focus on the family is bigger. Yeah. Uh, Ken, Ham, cool. Ken Ham's uh, Genesis thing, yeah. way bigger. Yeah. But Ken Ham, Ken Ham is never going to be among the cool kids. Right. Ever. Right. right. He, um, he, he's a fundamentalist who believes Genesis. Uh, <laughs> is, <laughs> so you, it's just not going to happen. So the, and I think this is part of the, um, part of the reason why there's a quickness to hostility in the, re, in the kickback against Big Eva is because Big Eva has, has exuded for some years now an elitist vibe. Okay, it's... Respectable. It's a, what's that? Respectable. Respectable, elitist, polished, cool, polished. slicked, cool. And uh, a lot of the people out in the country have just about had it with that. Yeah. And, and they're against all elites. They're against... And th because we, we are in a populist uprising. Mm -hmm. In the political realm and in the theological realm, it, there's a populist... Uprising. Which is dangerous. Which I is mean, dangerous. there's good things that can come of it, but it's also really dangerous. Uh, yes. Reactionary populist movements don't typically end well. Correct. Yeah. Uh, um, and so there's big, big problems with it, but that's how it goes. That's how it goes, yeah. That's how it goes. Guys, uh, I want to be respectful of your time. I have like five or six more questions. How are we doing? How much longer do we have? We're, we're good. Oof. Ten minutes. All right. <laughs> Joe, can you, uh, I like how you got the good cop, bad cop. Doug's like, I'll go all night. And he's like, you got 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, can you just speak a little bit about uh, your transition from Bethlehem to Moscow? Because yeah. I'm not going to say it was like cloak and dagger, but it was a big thing. A lot of people didn't really know why. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of the precipitating cause um, was um, mm -hmm. differences of opinion with leaders about substantive issues like political philosophy. Um, so political philosophy was sort of the presenting issue, um, which wasn't a new thing for me, but I think the wider conversation about Christendom, Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. sort of put that on the radar. The Overton and, window. Yeah, so expanding. all of a sudden, that's, yes. that's, the, that's the discussion that we're having. And so as we're having that discussion, and I'm, I've been more Protestant, classic Reformed, magisterial, two kingdoms, yeah. and as I was getting asked now to speak publicly as the president of the school, in various forums and articulating that, there was concern that that was gonna be sort of representative of the school. Sure. And it wasn't sort of where certain leaders in the school wanted the school to be. Um, and so because, so part of it was I was president, part of it was the substantive issue. And as we, the more we talked, the wider the divide got, the, we got the clarity and it was, oh, we're actually farther apart. Sure. And so as we, as my wife and I wrestled through that, it became evident that, um, this, uh, there's no reason to, Bethlehem's a great institution. They have in their own identity. 
um, some of it had to do with Moscow mood sort of stuff about, you know, yeah. how much, how, how influenced have I been? Do uh -huh. I want to bring that, that ethos? Do I want to bring Moscow mood to Minneapolis? Mm -hmm. Um, which was a hard question for me to answer at the time because I was like, well, I, I'm not trying to, but I'm not, not trying to either. Mm -hmm. Right. Like yeah. I, I was like, I didn't have as a principle, whatever I do, I must not be like Moscow. That was not on the radar. And so in that environment, being asked to lead an institution, it was like, I don't know how to do this well with that sort of pressure and that sort of expectation, right? Because it's trying to thread a needle that I don't value. I'm not trying to avoid that. Yeah. Um, and so in wrestling through it, it became evident that like I, I just fit better here. Like I, like I did, um, I like the Moscow mood. I like the build and fight. That's what I wanted to, to you do. You like Idaho? I, yeah, I'd ever, never, I'd been out here. I, I, I went to school here uh, distance and came out and we've been friends for 15 years or so. Um, so I had lots of friends and relationships, but it was, and it was clear that um, Bethlehem can be Bethlehem and it was just, I, f I fit better. And so in the course of that, it was, um, I'm gonna step down. I want the school to succeed. I want Bethlehem to flourish and thrive under Piper's leadership and everything else and pr praying that that happens. Um, and then I can sort of be myself and do, you know, do ministry in the way that I wanna do it. Andy Nacelli is still, Recovering from your departure, <laughs> yeah. brother. Andy's a good friend. Uh, good, good brother. Amazing thinker. Incredible writer. Uh, one, one more question before we get into the rapid fire questions. D Doug, you have been very calculated in your use of profanity. Uh, what would you say to Christians who just cuss? Not they're not using it like to make a point, serrated edge. They just cuss. I would say stop it. <laughs> just stop it. Um. Uh, Bob Newhart. <laughs> yeah, stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> yeah, stop it. Um, so basically, in English, this is the overview. In English, there are um, there's swearing, there's cursing, there's obscenity, and there's vulgarity. Okay, uh, swearing is taking the name of God, um, swearing an oath. Cursing is consigning someone uh, anathema or D go damn. to hell. Yeah. Damn. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, the um, obscenity. Well, obscenity is sexual, mm -hmm. uh, sexual in nature, uh, something that ought to be off stage. Mm -hmm. um, and then vulgarity would be junior high bathroom humor. Yeah. Right. So uh, the, all four of those, you can find uh, prohibitions in scripture uh, of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the Ten Commandments, do not take the name of the Lord mm -hmm. your God in vain. Swearing is breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Cursing, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Mm -hmm. Um, obscenity. Um, it's a shameful to mention what the disobedient do, do in, in secret. secret yeah. um, vulgarity. Uh, avoid coarse jesting yeah. in Ephesians. By the let your speech be yeah. seasonal. Um, yeah. So you, uh, all four. Okay, don't talk that way. So uh, I would I would take the list of all those passages to the people who are. The, I saw a T-shirt. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'd say just you shouldn't. Yeah. Um, let your, your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt. Yeah. Um, basically, stop it. Um, yeah. Uh, and then someone say, so what are you doing then? Uh-huh. Right. Which would be a fair question. Uh, would be a fair question. Every one of those four things, um, we see examples of Use people in the Bible. In scripture. Um, yeah. Swearing. Uh, Paul swears. As God is my witness. Uh, mm -hmm. God could find no one greater to swear by, so he swore by himself. Um, so there's a righteous swearing. There's a righteous cursing. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, then let him be accursed. Let, yeah. let him be accursed. If we are an angel from heaven, preach to you another gospel, let him be, let him be accursed. Yeah. Obscenity. Uh, Ezekiel has some, some yeah. uh, Ezekiel has some passages that I do not expect to ever preach on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because he's, he's way out there. Yeah. And even with the translators tidying him up, so. Ezekiel, Ezekiel uses calculated righteous obscenity, mm -hmm. right? And then vulgarity, the same uh, sort of thing. Isaiah, our righteousness is like filthy yeah. rags is a used menstrual, mm -hmm. menstrual. Or path. Paul in Philippians, yeah. Yeah. or scatological. Yeah. So you have, you, there are righteous examples of all four. Okay. Um, and uh, so I believe that the rule for using them, using such words ought to be sparingly because if you do it all the time, you're debasing the currency. Yeah, that's right. It, you, you lose the, the throw weight of the expression. 
It ought to be on occasions that you uh, that are analogous to the scriptural occasions. Mm -hmm. um, so you made reference to my use of the C word, um, which I will say the C word here, because it wasn't. Is this is not the occasion? That's right. That I was that I was using as fits before. the occasion. As fits the occasion. It's very important. Right. So when I was um, engaging with a couple of feminists who were had mel one of them had melted down purity rings that mm -hmm. Christian girls had turned into her and turned it into a little bowling trophy um, uh, vagina mm -hmm. and and was awarding that little bowling trophy to Gloria Steinem. What they, what they were doing was reducing women to that. That's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so my use of it was I, I simply stepped, this was a reductio. I stepped into their argument and said, what you're saying is that women are just this. Mm -hmm. that, that's what you're saying. And it was a, like a punch in the mouth. And it was on purpose, sparing. I've never used that word before or since. In, you know, it's just not part of my discourse, but it was fully appropriate in that moment. Mm. So th basically, now I can understand someone saying, yeah, I don't buy it, and say, okay, great. Um, but I've done my best to show you. But I've, I've, this is yeah. my reasoning, yeah. and I want you to acknowledge that I'm not simply swinging my liberty to cuss around on the end of a rope. That's right. 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 It's a very calculated, I take the tool out of the toolbox, Use it and put it back. It's an active, and it's an active translation. Here's what they were saying with statues. I'm just going to put it in English. Mm, and the yeah. other thing that was in play there was um, evangelical organizations sort of scratching their chins and taking it seriously, right? So I think at the time, White Horse Inn or somebody like that <laughs> yeah. was sort of dignifying this and saying, "What can we learn from this? Is this a should, should we learn something here about purity culture?" And so they're looking at this appalling display and sort of and they're nuancing it. Right. This would be a good example of like, we're going to nuance this. And then Doug came in with some clarity and said, this is what they're saying. Do we really want to nuance this? One of my goals, in life, one of my goals in life is to smell like burnt what, marsh wiggle. Yeah, burnt what? It, burnt marsh wiggle. Narnia. Narnia. Oh, okay, man. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> Rapid fire questions. This okay. can go as quickly as you want them to go as long as we stay within the 10 consigned minutes, which I think is three now. Tea or coffee? Tea. Coffee. Have either of you guys watched The Office? The off the, the show, show? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah okay all right yeah. uh, if you could only be trapped uh, with the collected works of any theologian on an island but just their works and nobody else's who would it be yeah, Chesterton said uh, Goldwyn's Guide to Shipbuilding <laughs> 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 something, <laughs> Getting something like that uh -huh. um, if I if I had to I would say Calvin's Institutes yeah, well, you could have his whole collected works it doesn't just have to be the oh. institutes. Oh yeah, so not man. just one book, all the collected works. Oh, I'd say collected. Lewis. Yeah, probably still Calvin. Uh, still Calvin. Yeah. Uh, mountains or beach? For vacation, you mean? Whatever. Yeah. Well, you can probably take beach. that however you want. Mountains. Mountains. Uh, champagne or wine? Wine. Champagne. Ooh, fancy. <laughs> yeah. uh, least favorite candy. Least favorite least. candy. Oh, I'm searching for an answer here. I hope you give it to me. Heath bar. Uh, oh, okay. Any, anything, uh, with, anything with coconut. <laughs> Black licorice right here. Uh, Android or iPhone? iPhone. iPhone. Macaroni salad or potato salad? Potato. Oh, potato salad. Now, this one's real fancy. Foie gras or escargot? Oh, man. I know you guys uh, I probably abominate eat a lot. both of them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'd do escargot. Night out. I don't or, even know what foie gras is. Night out or night in? In. In. Concert or football game? Football game. What kind of concert? Any kind of concert you want. Well, Lady Gaga, uh, Taylor, Taylor Swift. Swift. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say, um, man, that's a tie. Okay. Uh, I'll, right. I'll go with football game. Morning person or night owl? Morning. Morning. As you get older, more? Or have mm -hmm. you always been morning person? No, always I, been morning. Okay. Always been morning, but I'm getting more and more morning. <laughs> uh, Burger King or McDonald's? And you have to choose? McDonald's. Burger King. Uh, Mexican or Italian? Mexican. Mexican. So they're your least favorite? No, favorite. Oh, your favorite. Uh, the race or the food? <laughs> <laughs> Was the government involved in 9-11? <laughs> burger or barbecue? Burger. Uh, burger. Chinese takeout and not the good stuff. I'm talking like it's 2 a.m. You can only get really bad. Chinese takeout or sushi? Oh, never sushi. 
Never sushi. Never sushi. Sushi, sushi. okay. I want, but it's got the Chinese takeout has to have enough MSG to oh. make the spoon taste good. That's <laughs> what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's the magic sauce. Uh, rock or rap? Oh, rock. I can't t- t- handle rap. Can't handle rap. Did I, you ever I, get into any of the, like the lyrical theology no, stuff? No, I. I um, ra- there's some species of rap that I think is very impressive. Yeah. I, I think it's just very impressive. Yeah. But I'm a classic rock. Peaked guy. in the late '90s. Classic Classical rock. or jazz? Um, classical. Classical. I'm surprised you had to think so long about it. Jazz is terrible. Well, because uh, it depends. If if you put um, either, either jazz, if I if you put it on for like four hours, yeah, Sunday afternoon, after about two hours, I'm ready to be done. Yeah, and it's a, it's a second. I can love classical music, and I do. But I can't take a lot of it. I can't take the long haul. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're out of time, so let me just finish these up. Uh, one systematic theology on an island. I think you already got, gave your answer, Calvin, Calvin's. Yeah. Um, probably Calvin. Yeah. Uh, which hymn do you want to be sung at your funeral? I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power. No, the other one. All hail the power. Of oh, Jesus. okay. Yeah. Different tune. Different yeah. Tune. Um, be thou my vision. So good. Um, how many holes does a straw have? How many what? How holes? many holes does a straw have? It's just one hole. All the way <laughs> you through. You sure about that? <laughs> All the way through. If a lizard loses his tail, where does he go get, a, get another one? Retail store. Dang it, man. Did, did like your grandson <laughs> tell you that joke? <laughs> all right, guys, that's all I have. I'm supremely thankful for this conversation. I pray the Lord blesses it uh, for the good of his people, for the glory of his name. Uh, Doug, will you close us in prayer, brother? Sure. Thank you. Our Father God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We are very grateful. Uh, I pray that you would use this conversation to bless your saints. I pray that it would be instructive and corrective and encouraging. Um, in all the different ways it needs Mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. We're very grateful for our brother coming all this way. And I I pray that you bless his labors, bless his ministry, bless his work. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me record my immovable conviction that this is the noblest service in which any human being can spend or be spent. And that, if God gave me back my life to be lived over again, I would, without one quiver of hesitation, lay it on the altar to Christ, that he might use it as before in similar ministries of love, especially amongst those who have never yet heard the name of Jesus. At Ten of Those, we want to serve the local church by equipping your church family with great resources that are going to point them to Jesus. So we'll come and set up a pop-up bookstore in your church. There's no charge. We'll come for your Sunday services. Maybe you've got a, a weekend retreat or a conference. We would love to come and then make recommendations. This is one I've read three times now. It's called Incomparable by Andrew Wilson. And he goes through 60 characteristics of God. It just wonderfully takes our eyes off off the world, off ourselves, and puts them on our Saviour. Now we've got lots of things for families and uh, and kids. For parents, I want to recommend this series. This one is Raising Kids in a Screen-Saturated World. Our passion is to get good books that hold the Bible read by as many people as possible. We handpick our bookstore, it's curated, so we know everything we sell will point to the Lord Jesus. Everything's discounted. And as we make recommendations, we're seeking to serve your church family. 
so that they may be excited and equipped to read good books. And as they do, we'll be praying that it might just change their life.